Welcome to the Great Bass Tennis Podcast, episode 71, coming to you from Boynton Beach, Florida, FM Tennis Performance Center. Our guest tonight is Fergus O'Rourke. We've had tennis parents, tennis coaches, tennis students, but tonight we have an intern, Fergus O'Rourke. It's an Irish name. I tease people and say he's really from Springfield, Missouri, and he's just doing a great Irish accent. I, uh, Fergus, tell us a little about yourself. Where are you from? I'm from Dublin, Ireland. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me on, Steve. Dublin, Ireland. It's and a, uh, it's a very good accent. It's yeah. For a guy from Missouri. No, I got my got my story, yeah. And yes. um, yeah, spent 18 years there. And then I went to Lander University for two years, thanks to Dave Miley. Um, and then I transferred to Spring Hill College in Mobile, Alabama. And I've been there the last two and a half years. And tell us your connection to us. How did How did you end up? Hanging out with us. Basically, I spent uh, summer 2018, summer 2019, and summer of 2021 working with Charles van der Merve at the Field Club of Greenwich, and he's a South African. And he was familiar with you, I think from some connection with, uh, who's the guy, uh, Julian Krinsky, possibly. Yeah. I think he might've worked for Julian Krinsky. And so Charles really knows the game really well. And my game, uh, was a train wreck and still is to some extent, but it was worse uh, three, three and a half years ago or whatever. So he would show me these videos of this crazy guy on these clay courts down in Florida. And uh, the crazy guy was me. That was you. Oh. So he, he was, yeah, the, it's just the basics, you know, the basic strokes. And this is the reason Charles showed me was because I hadn't a clue how to teach tennis, you know, and I was just uh, up there feeding balls and, um, so he was trying to show me just a little bit about this is how you should be teaching people. So I, I really didn't do anything with that information for uh, quite a while, two years, over two years. And then uh, summer 2020, I was in South Carolina and I was dating a girl at the time. Uh, it was during the lockdown situation and that kind of broke down. And I came down to Mobile, Alabama, and I was in, um, in Mobile doing absolutely nothing going a little bit crazy uh, at the time, except I would play tennis two or three times a week. And I thought, how will I get better at tennis? And then I remembered Charles had shown me this crazy guy down in Florida. What was his name? Steve Smith. That was his name. Steve Smith, great bass tennis. And you had just started the podcast at the time. This is at the end okay. of summer 2020. And I really started enjoying all your interviews. And honestly, more than um, your tennis information, what I enjoyed more was your outlook on life and your outlook on the game. I really liked your kind of no-nonsense philosophy. Uh, and it was just a breath of fresh air hearing you. I don't know. I could listen to you all day, you know. Well, our, and, listener, uh, our listeners should know that uh, he's saying that because I buy him Guinness. Yeah. No, I'm just, just he's No, but thanks for the compliment. But just to backtrack, though, Julian Krinsky. We'll have to get Julian on as a guest. But that's uh, the connection where Charles, he worked for Julian going back to the mid 80s, I would travel up to Philadelphia. Julian at one point had the largest, I'm sure it was the largest, if not one of the largest tennis camps in the United States. And uh, JKST, then it became Julian Krinsky uh, camps and programs. But that, that's another conversation, but Julian will have to talk to him. But they had to shut down because the COVID stuff. I, I looked at their website and they called it a day when they had to stop, I think. That was the end of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know that, um, they're regrouping and rebuilding and, and, um, I'm not sure with Julian and Tina with, uh, there's been, I know spent a lot of time out in California. If they're, they would ever go back to where, where it was, I can remember sending my oldest son there for an SAT camp. Uh, they had cooking and business. They even had one for being a sports agent. They were on the Villanova campus, um, Haverford. For the most part, Haverford, beautiful campus, and Villanova and UPenn. Um, the uh, so you you came down to us in uh, t Tampa, and you went through the assessment. Orlando, it was Orlando. Orlando, and I harassed you for about a month. Um, I called you. Yes. I, I sent you an email, and then you said, "Give me a call." So anyone who's tried to call Steve knows that he doesn't always answer, but he will always try to call you back. And then if you don't answer, he's going to leave a message. So we played phone tag a little bit and then 
uh, I basically said, Steve, can I come down over Christmas? And you said, oh, I don't know, it's going to be busy and with the pandemic and we'll have to ask Leo. And so I said, well, what if I ask my teachers, can I study online? And if I come down right now? So this was about mid-September and then we went back and forth for about a month and I thought it was going to actually fall through. You, you had some reason to get cold feet uh, near near game day, you know, but I said, oh, come on, I've already got permission well, to leave. Well, well, to digress, <laughs> let me... Uh, and, and then I came down mid-October, so yeah. Let, let me thank you for correcting me. Senior moment, uh, yes, definitely in Orlando. I spent 15 years in Tampa. And Leo, uh, Andy Fitzell's wife, helped us out so much with... Um, yeah, so you came down. Um, I remember uh, reprimanding you before you came down. You asked me a question. Remember that? What that was? I do. I, I I'm embarrassed to to recall, but yeah, I do very well. I asked you about coffee. You asked us if we had coffee, and I said, "Please, come up with another question." Yeah, it's a stupid question. But then I asked you. No, no, no. Such how's it go? I. Um, no such thing as a dumb question. Just a question asked by a dumb kid. No such thing as a stupid question. Just a question asked by a stupid kid. But well, you know, um, that's not original. It's not original. In the same conversation, I asked you if I could leave and go to mass on a Sunday, and you said I kind of redeemed myself there. You said that's a that's good that you want to go to mass. <laughs> good Catholic <laughs> boy. You, you um, liked that question. <laughs> with uh, yeah, I know we had some problems with that during the pandemic. Yeah, with um, I remember my brother Matt when he went away to boarding school, then I went away to the same boarding school, and our our great aunt Anna would always ask us if we're going to mass, and my brother Matt said. Yes, and and I go to Saint Pillow and Holy Mattress. Right, Saint Pillow and Holy Mattress. So, what's your recall on coming down? Your initial assessment. We make that a prerequisite for those um, new to our podcast. Um, unless someone's a total beginner, they have to be videotaped, film all their essential strokes, and we make a narrated slow motion analysis. Now it's a, a private YouTube clip. I can remember when it was a. Uh, a VHS and then a DVD. But why don't you touch upon that? Uh, and so actually in introducing you, um, certainly we'll talk more about that being a tennis player, but you came to us with the idea that you were going to improve both. Right. You're just in your early 20s, 21, 22? No, I'm 23. Getting 23. old, Steve. Nearly as old as you, but um, yeah, I came, up, catching up. I came down. I remember I, uh, this is on, not very relevant. My phone was broken, and I, so I didn't have an alarm. And uh, so the, I heard these alarms going off. I think it was the kids were getting up pretty early, maybe five thirty or something. You maybe six. You, and got, you, got, you should practice uh, Rocky Balboa. You got to you got to be on the court before the sun comes. Pretenders out. and contenders. I, I'm, I think I'm a pretender. But um, yeah. So so early morning didn't get a lot of sleep, and uh, you started you started teasing me. You said I was from Scotland. That's what you told the kids. I think and. What Steve will do is he'll, he'll kind of, he'll be charming when you first get there, you know, and you're like, geez, this isn't so bad. But you hear him yelling at other people. So you think, geez, yeah, and, and, you, and you, he hasn't yelled at you yet. So, so you think, geez, maybe this guy likes me. But, <laughs> but it's, <laughs> it's only a matter of time before, you know, you're in the, you're in the hot seat and, and you're getting yelled at. And, and you should definitely not laugh if Steve is yelling at someone else. That's, that's probably the worst thing you could do. And I made that mistake a few times. But um. It's, it's, so, just, it's just volume. It's just volume. Yeah. No, it's, it's, all, it's all good. But um, yeah, I remember I played, uh, I played a bit against Shea. I, I played a couple of tie breaks. And then the first Saturday I was there, Matt Clore gave me a, a lesson on the singles court. He's, uh, I think, 37 maybe. At the time, he was probably 36. And he beat me love and love. I won the first point, I remember. There you go. We have it on film. That's, and, uh, we'll erase the rest. Yes, yeah, it's, it's still there. But um. That technical tape, I mean, I watched it a few times. I, I need to watch it probably 10 times because it's just, as you, you always do, you give the preliminary information and then you just go through stroke by stroke. So um, my experience th those first three months was basically, depending on how busy it was, I could train with the kids, basically, as if I was one of the kids. And then if it got really busy, I would help you a bit more with video and, and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, if you come to work with Steve, you... You're always learning, you know, you, you just do what you're told and no matter what you're doing, I mean, there's so many lessons in everything, you know, and um, so it's been, yeah, it's been a fantastic experience. I mean, no, nothing short of, it's no exaggeration to say it's life changing, you know, I, I think you need to be immersed in it 
to get a to get a lot out of it. Obviously, it's good to it's better than nothing to be here for a day or two or maybe a week. But then you go back to where you came from, right? And you're surrounded by another environment. So if you're here for a few months, you kind of you start speaking the language, and then you start. Hopefully, you can take it wherever you go when you leave. You know. Yeah, I remember uh, Chad Burial. I repeat this often. I heard him once say that uh, it takes you two years just to figure out what's going on. Right. Uh, it's it's not a quick study. You know, it's, to be immersed in it. Um, we feel like if people were to watch Tennis Intelligence Apply, a 25-hour course, they could get so much out of it. But you know, I do think that uh, there's no substitute for hands-on, you know, bricks and mortars to actually be there. And then when you go back and look at film, um, there's just things jump out at you. Right. That's yeah. one thing I would say is one thing you will learn if you, well, if, if you're lucky enough to do an internship or whatever, uh, the video analysis to do that with you or for anyone listening to do that with Steve, to watch Steve do video analysis is very, very uh, helpful because you see how Steve identifies certain flaws. You know, th that's something that you can't get from watching Tennis Intelligence Applied or whatever to, s to see the actual process, you know. And then what you'll notice is a lot of people make the same mistakes, right? So whether it's a big backswing or an open racket face or palm up on the serve, you know, it's very few people, I'm sure, make a mistake that you haven't seen a thousand times before. So it's very helpful then. Y you see things in the video, but then you'll see them no matter where you are after that, you know. With the technical tape and the tactical tape, um, once someone ha has a tape, we say, okay, watch it three times. As you mentioned the first time, we just play your essential strokes that have been, been filmed in three different angles. Well, you watch that at regular speed with preliminary information, you know, the dimensions of the court and physical law, dictate stroke production, no coach's opinion, any unique theory of Bradenism. But it's, it's, it's really fact-based with, um, it is diagnostic, you know, there's a flaw, there's a cause, and there's a cure. And there's a matter of looking for the primary flaw, identifying that. But you also need to know the timetable. And obviously you don't wanna make a technical tape. You know, we do make technical tapes for players and tell the parents to watch it, but don't have the child watch it until they're done with such and such tournaments if right. they're scheduled to play the next several weeks. With We also, um, like to have people when we get done and go, and we, now we go through information, don't think about your game. Initially just think about the game because when you're working on technique, it's, it's uh, really two, two sides to it. You're doing it one to improve your own game, prevention of injury and just improve performance, but also so you have an eye, you can look on the other side of the net and you can detect your opponent's strengths and weaknesses you know, very, very quickly and then make adjustments accordingly when you're actually on the court playing. Right. With, um, tell us a little bit about, you know, growing up in Ireland. I mean, sports, hurling, and then we can get back to coming over how you got here. And right. The different, the two different colleges. Yeah. Um, growing up in Ireland, I was always uh, pretty good at sport. Uh, played soccer pretty seriously till I was 12. I played Gaelic football pretty seriously from about, let's say, age nine to age 18. And I played hurling. I was a little bit soft for the hurling, actually. Um, you would have been a good hurler. You know, there's a, people are holding a stick and uh, you had to start wearing a helmet as of 2012. Uh, before that, only kids had to wear helmets. But anyway, uh, so that's GAA, Gaelic Athletic Association. Um, you talk, I mean, maybe this is something to come back to, but the whole community aspect of the GAA, you talked about the hockey, you can't leave your hockey uh, team based on where you lived. That was the way it was when you were younger, right? It's the same with the GAA, even to this day. I mean, there's so many things in Ireland that uh, are like everywhere else in the world or whatever. And in terms of, I don't know, globalization and commercialization of, of all sorts of things. But the GAA is that sort of, it's where that rootedness in, in your community and in your tradition is still very much, um, it's very it's very real even to this day. And it's quite a beautiful thing. But anyway, um, I played tennis from the age of four, but never really seriously, you know, never like these kids, Mahar and Shay, um, they're 
tennis, tennis, tennis. You know, I was never really on that train at all as a young, as a young person. And uh, I don't really have any regrets about that. I would be obviously a better tennis player if I'd played four hours a day from the age that I was five. But I'm very grateful that I did all sorts of different things. You know, when I grew up and uh, like I played music and I would say I had a relatively normal upbringing. And uh, I mean, with everything, there's sacrifice, right? If you're going to be a professional tennis player, you can't have a normal childhood. If you, if you want to be, if you want to have a good childhood or if you want to have a childhood like everybody else, you, you're not going to be the best tennis player in the world, you know? Well, so it's, it's, it's yeah. with everything, there's, you know, you can't have it every way. So anyway, that's, that's that. So, so my tennis, just to be specific about the tennis, um, I would say I had good coaches. Uh, I would say I didn't get technical instruction from any of them really you know because i was always competing and i never said okay i want to really take the time out to do this and they never maybe would have said okay fergus you got to stop competing for a year because i mean maybe i mean who wants to be told that you know who wants to deliver that news you're obviously happy to tell people that but it's just not the norm um and then as you get older it's harder to change you know so uh, like I think there's a lot of good tennis coaches in Ireland and I can't, I don't know. I'm a product of wanting to win. I would say my tennis game is, is a product of wanting to win at all costs as opposed to a product of bad teaching necessarily. Oh, I, do you know, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's go through the few things. I know yeah. that, uh, yeah, I had the opportunity to meet your parents. I remember your mother saying, well, I don't know if he was listening Right. when you were younger. I think there's definitely a different difference between coaching and teaching. Right. Coaching is a, we define as a human relationship. Teaching, information transfer. Use the term norm. Boris Becker, if you want abnormal results, you can't do it's normal. Exactly. But I do think uh, you know Ireland is certainly different than uh, here in the U.S., where uh, kids are not specializing like exactly. they do here so early. Correct. Uh, you touched upon. Um, you know, staying with your club. Uh, in this country, years ago, we had residency rules and sport was much better. Uh, like for myself growing up playing ice hockey, back in the day, everybody played house hockey on a Saturday. And then on a Sunday, there was only one travel team. Like Syracuse had one travel team, Rochester, Buffalo. Uh, you know, then certainly the sport expanded. Um, but it, then it got to the point where everything was an all-star team. But it was great when it was residency rules. You had the most fun playing house hockey because you played with kids from your neighborhood. And then you'd come home and then you would play. But let's go with, uh, I mean, I guess I should say this, is um, my connection to Ireland. Right. An Irish American. Proud to be an Irish American. <laughs> um, my grandmother, Mikhail, um, she certainly was the first one to say there's, there's, there's two types of people, the Irish and... For those that wish they were. That was the uh, first text you ever sent me, by the way. She, um, you know, someone that she knew quite well. She was married three times, and the uh, the third time, the young man married an Irish American. And I remember my grandmother Raquel saying he finally got it right. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, I was married to a gal um, from Ireland. Like to tease people and say it was a wonderful, strange relationship that I was wonderful and she was strange. But it was the other way around. I was the one that's strange. I would tell our listeners, never marry a coach. But I was married about 20 years. I've been divorced about 20 years. Um, I always tease and say, with, uh, if you're, I was married to an Irish woman. I always had the last two words, yes, dear. Right. So um, we'll get into that. I mean, before uh, I met my former wife, I had gone to Ireland to play tennis. So uh, it was great to finally go to Ireland, but but with um, to talk a little bit more about you know like hurling and Gaelic football, you, you know the Irish. I mean, there's huge crowds, and it's still an amateur sport. Correct? Exactly, the athletes are not paid money. Yeah, they it's it's completely amateur, and so you'd have eighty thousand people at the national finals. You know, Dublin playing against Kerry, for example, in football or Gaelic football, Gaelic football, or, and uh, Limerick and Kilkenny in the hurling or whatever, and uh, eighty thousand people there. You know. And the athletes and are amateurs. It's all amateur. They, they have normal jobs, you know. I mean, they don't have... They are training nearly professionally, you know. Like, it's a huge sacrifice. And there's other perks that come with it, you know. You might get a job in the bank thanks to who you are or whatever the case may be. Or there's a lot of them are teachers, you know. But, yeah, it's, it's, 
it's really amazing. And people in America, especially, really struggle to get their head around that, you know. It's Gaelic football, but hurling's the same, correct? Her- amateur? Amateur, yeah, yeah. Gaelic football and hurling, yeah. They're played on the same field, 15 aside. You have a goalkeeper, six backs, two midfielders, and six forwards. And, uh, and how about rugby? I mean, if you were to rate, what's the most popular sport? I looked this up recently. I believe soccer is actually the most played sport. I, I could be wrong on that, but soccer, I'm pretty sure, is the most played, uh, I would say, closely followed by Gaelic football, or else it's the other way around. But Gaelic football is... Uh, number one. I think soccer might be number one. Anyway, they're both pretty close. Well, but and, not as far as participation. Like in Canada, oh, which is the most like, pop- like in Canada, more kids play soccer than hockey. Mm. But and actually, on, on paper, lacrosse is the national sport of Canada. But right. But I mean, hockey is religion in Canada. So right. I, I would guess it's this way. I would say Gaelic football is one, hurling's two, rugby's three. Yeah, I'd say Gaelic football, there's nowhere in the country where that's not played, if that makes sense. There are some pockets of the country where there's no hurling, you know. So Gaelic football is, is easier to organize because you don't need a stick, you don't need a helmet, you know. So yeah, fine, we'll, we'll go with your, your analysis, yeah. But as a, as a schoolboy... Um, I, yeah, rugby. Um, rugby is a bit like tennis in terms of the socioeconomic uh, environment. You know, where it's really only played by rich kids. You know, uh, so that's generally true. I'm sure that it's not absolutely true, but um, like rugby is big in a few private schools in Dublin and in uh, the south of the country, and but it wouldn't be anywhere near as 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 widely played as other sports. It's very popular in terms of the Irish national team. But that's because very few countries play rugby and Ireland are one of the best countries in the world at rugby, you know, but it's, yeah. there's not that many countries that play. So, I mean, to be our soccer players are, um, they're phenomenal athletes, obviously, but they're not in the top five teams in the world because everyone in the world plays soccer, you know. So um, that's that's the sporting kind of kind of situation with uh, that. Yeah, the, the tennis Sorry, that was one thing I wanted to come back to. I would say there's no, tennis isn't widely played because why would you play tennis when you could play, why would you pay 50 euro an hour to get taught how to play tennis when you could, uh, like in my parents' case, they had no involvement in my team sports, basically. They might have given me a ride every now and then, but they practically could leave me to run down to the local facility or whatever and train or else get a ride from someone's dad, right? And it's all voluntary. You know, so why the hell would you want to play tennis, you know? So um, people often say, well, why, why don't we play tennis in Ireland and why haven't we had a guy in the top 100? It's, it's, a lot of it is probably just because of the numbers. We don't have that many people playing, you know? Well, it's and, and so expensive, popul- it's as you know. It's just the population. I think yeah, of, uh, it's a small country. I think of Ireland, you know, it's equivalent to New Hampshire. Right. So you were at 4 million, now you're 5, is that right? Yeah, I think if you, if you look it up, the, uh, the island of Ireland is probably about 8 I, you, you, I, you'd have to check that, but I, you know about Northern Ireland, obviously. Right, you know right, that's right. that's two or three million people probably, and then the Republic of Ireland is probably five or six million. So it, I think it's a similar in size to the state of South Carolina. I'm pretty sure that's a, and then population, yeah, similar. Fergus is a lefty. Fergus is very, very fast, and uh, he's mentioned some players by first name: Shay Malar, people that he, he's trained with, and. Um, it's like, well, who's the best? You know, so we, we like to play soccer. It'd be nice to play every day. We play all these different sports. And Fergus is humble. He goes, because people say that he was, the, the, the tennis players would say, you know, he's phenomenal at soccer. And he, with humility, said, uh, I haven't played since I'm 12. I can only use my, my left foot. Right. right? And, yeah, I was uh, one of those guys. I also, also to, uh, I was telling uh, one of the coaches today from Columbia, you know, we've had situations where, okay, say we have 14 players and four of them are foreign and we'll play soccer with the foreigners. It'd be ten, four foreigners right. against 10 Americans. Right. With, uh, but you, so go by a season. What, what did you do in the fall? You played a different sport every season, right? Let me think. Uh, no, I would say football and hurling were, oh, geez, Steve, I can't really remember actually. They, I would say the only season I can think of in my head would be tennis competition was pretty much exclusively in the summer. So the other sports would probably be pretty year round and then they might, they might break over the summer, something like that. But the tennis, the great thing about um, 
my tennis situation was, well, uh, by contrast, right, Shea or Malhar, these kids, they, they live in Orlando slash, um, they travel here and there, but for them to go to a tournament, their parents might need to drive them for hours and then they might need to stay and pay for a hotel and pay a massive entry fee, right? That costs a huge amount of money. For me to play pretty much every single tournament in Ireland, I could stay in my house and get a train or a bus to the, the club, which was in, within, say, 20 miles or 30 miles of my house, you know? And, and so I was very lucky in that sense. I was pretty independent in my tennis uh, competition. And, and I hated when my parents came to watch. And uh, I don't think they'll... Uh, yeah, that's they, they wouldn't like that, you know, and, and, but they don't mind me saying that. And I think I'm not the only one who, who doesn't no, like that. No, I, I'm not sure if it's over 50%, but uh, <clears throat> I make sure that uh, we conquer that, where you... Where you get over it. <laughs> you, have to, you have to be able to assist, erase the crowd. You, you right. thrive on the crowd, but once the match starts, you don't even know the crowd's there. Yeah. With... Um, yeah, becoming an athlete, obviously playing multiple sports, that doesn't happen so much as we said in the U S. Um, but t in Ireland, obviously it's very small, but it's cityfied. It's pretty much just played in what Dublin, Cork, Limerick. Yeah. It's not really played in the country. No, no, it wouldn't really, you know, you'd, it'd be like a surprise if you're to find a tennis club in the middle of nowhere, do you know, where here you, you'd find public courts really all over the place. No matter yeah. what town you're in in America, there's probably some public tennis courts, you know. And, and then the weather is a factor. I mean, you've talked about the, the rain and the, the lack of indoor courts. I think recently, uh, Connacht, you know what Connacht is. It's one of the provinces. It's the least populous uh, and most rural of the provinces, probably. But uh, they've got some bubbles now. And that's a, that's a pretty major step, you know. Before, there were no indoors in Connacht. And I don't think... There are any indoors in, in Munster. There might be a couple, you know, but pretty much none. There's a few up in Belfast, and then there are a few in Dublin too. But yeah, it's it rains a lot in Ireland, and uh, without indoors, it's it's pretty difficult to to play tennis regularly. I mean, it's impossible actually to to reliably play tennis uh, without indoor courts, and we don't have a whole lot of indoor courts. So that's uh, I mean, that's one of the good things about being in Southern Florida, you know, all that sunshine. With um Let's back up a little bit. Um, family, how many kids? You're the youngest of? The youngest of six, yeah. Yeah, uh, my parents... Um, the best comes last. I'm the youngest of six. Right. The encore child. Yeah. No, my parents, um, they're both broadcasters. Uh, my dad is sort of semi-retired, I would say, uh, but he was pretty, pretty. Uh, I mean, incredibly busy. And, well, I would say very very professional very disciplined very unlike me you know and he, he worked really hard for 45 years basically uh started as a journalist in a local newspaper and then moved into to radio and a bit of tv as well and then mom is um i would say a bit more creative than dad she's a bit more like me i would say and they you, met you mean you're like her yeah uh -huh. exactly that's it um yeah, so, so she, I think they met, they were both going for the same job. And I think she got the job. And I think he said something like, oh, you, you got my job or something like that, you know. And so um, they met working in RTE. And she actually commentated uh, at Wimbledon. You know that. Yeah, um, tell us RTE. RTE, Radio Telefiche Aaron. So it's the Irish equivalent of the BBC. And uh, she met, she actually asked John McEnroe a question. Apparently he was playing Davis Cup against Ireland. And... Uh, I think she asked him, I think she asked him to do an interview or something and he promised her the day before that he would. And then I think after a certain match, he said, I'm not talking to anyone except for that one girl from RT or whatever. So he was true to his word, to be fair. Like, cool. I don't know how long they spoke, but uh, yeah, she interviewed McIntyre. Or maybe it was just one question, but yeah, she... She covered Wimbledon for a number of years, right? Yeah, I, I don't know how many years, but yeah, she, she went over to Wimbledon a few times, yeah. Well, that's one of the re reasons uh, we're having Fergus on, uh, other than uh, the listening to that uh, great Irish accent, and he's going he's to sing for us here in a little bit. But with uh, being an amateur um, with these podcasts, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking for criticism. I, I tell our students all the time, okay, it's nice to be complimented, but just thrive on criticism. So I have quite a few people uh, that I've reached out to say, so tell us how we can make these podcasts better. And um, tell us a little bit about 
through your parents. I mean, you've had your own podcast, you had a radio show. Tell right. us a little bit about that. Yeah, so my f- the first school I went to, Lander University, and they had a radio station there. It's called XLR Lander Radio. And I had one teacher who really kind of took me under his wing a little bit and would give me advice and that sort of thing. And he told me at the very end of my first semester, he said, have you heard about the radio station? You should go and you should go and like talk to Paul Crutcher. He's going to, he'd love to have you on air kind of thing. So I went down and uh, bonded with the guy, Paul Crutcher, who was running the radio station. And I developed over the Christmas break, I developed an idea to do a show called The Irish Hour. So what I would do then was um, I'd play Irish music and some American music. And I would interview someone every week. You're just 18 years old. I was 19 at the time. Yeah. And I would, um, my mom would listen, you know, and she would give me fierce criticism when, when I wasn't prepared. And uh, you were winging it. Yeah. But, and so it was actually, it was a really good experience, even though I probably only did, I don't know, 10 or 15 broadcasts. It felt like it, it was a big, uh, it was a big undertaking. And, and uh, I did a pretty good job, I think. And I really enjoyed it. Like I, as I, I actually wrote about this the other day, I think I discovered that I like the sound of my own voice, as narcissistic as that sounds, you know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it was a great experience. And I would put it on Facebook. I would broadcast, like it was, a, it was, a, it was an internet radio station, so no one's going to listen to it in the car, you know. But it was on in the cafeteria at the school. And then I would put a, a Facebook Live. I had my phone sitting here, and then it, I would just broadcast it to, I don't know, a few hundred people, you know. With... Um, um, How's it go? You can only wing it if you've won it. And if you haven't won it, you can't wing it. Okay. I remember being that age, 19 years old. It was at Colgate. I had a cast on my foot, and I was interviewed between periods. The Colgate a hockey team was playing this school I went to, um, Suigo, um, one of the state universities on, on Lake Ontario. And, and I, I was doing fine during the intro in between the first period and then there's obviously in between the second period, and I remember the, the, the color commentator, you know, the one who's dressing it up uh, mm-hmm. with a little bit of uh, this and that, said, I'm coming to you live, and I just froze. Really? I, mean, I was just, thought, I, initially, the, the first time I talked to him was just a conversation, the second time, so, you, you know, you're going to be on the radio the, 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 in between, you know, the start of the game, in between the first and second, and then I, I mean... You choked. That, that was my. I definitely <laughs> choked. That was my career in uh, wow. radio. With um, now with that, uh, that interfered with your tennis a little bit. The yeah, I mean, I, I, it's like I extracurricular did everything except play tennis at that first school. You know, it was hard for me to knuckle down and focus on the tennis. Um, I would say for two reasons. Firstly, uh, my nature is to be distracted and to try to do different things and get bored easily and want to do something new. And secondly, the team was very good at Lander, and I wasn't making the team. So I remember you said a statistic, uh, you've said it a, m- a number of times, 85% of players who don't make the lineup in their freshman year don't make the lineup at all. And so once, once I kind of got there, and it was clear to me that to get into the lineup, I'd need to get an awful lot better. And I might have tried at that for you know a month or two. I probably just said... I mean, I think it's somewhat consciously and somewhat you don't accept that you're really making this decision, but I probably just said, screw that, you know, and I'll try and get as much out of this school experience that I can uh, in spite of being on the tennis team, you know. But you came over, you were on a scholarship. Yeah, I was on a scholarship. About, I mean, people don't really talk money or whatever, but it was costing, um, I don't know, I think it's okay to say this. It was costing uh, in the region of $15,000 a year to go to, to Lander. And uh, so that's, I mean, for an Irish person, that's a huge amount of money because college is free back home. But I mean, some schools are 50 grand, you know? So, uh, I mean, I, I got a huge amount out of those two years doing all the other things, you know? Well, Lander is a powerhouse. They've won so many, it's a D2 school, South yeah. Carolina. They've won so many national championships. Yeah, that 12, I think 12 national championships. They, I think they won eight in a row. Or, or 10 in a row or something between NAIA and, and NCAA. And uh, there was one year in particular, I think it was in 2000, they beat the Division I national championships from the year before, or the national champions from the year before, Georgia. You can, um, you can look that up. When, I think Georgia won it in 99. And uh, Lander won Division Two, and Lander beat them the following year. So you pointed out, I think, sometimes, I mean, maybe the Georgia team didn't have their full lineup, but still, it doesn't matter. That's pretty... 
That's no, still pretty no, impressive, they, you know. There's definitely D three teams. It can be D one teams. It yeah. becomes pretty confusing. Um, but it was with, with Lander. Um, we'll have to have a separate podcast on Robert Steckley, a Canadian, same age as Roger Federer. So so super fast. He's done a lot of coaching on the WTA tour, a little bit on the ATP. Quite a character, but he 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 won a national championship playing for for Lander. Yeah, Joe Cabri. Yeah, the coach. We've had a couple. Uh, we had a couple of visitors today that. Uh, I know you, you and I sat around and talked to two former students, uh, and their people are shocked at what I can remember. But I do think it's from my mother a little bit because she was nostalgic and she was a storyteller. But also, adrenaline is great for memory, and I I do run practice with a little bit little bit of adrenaline. But anyway, not to digress. But, Instant uh, hostility. Yes, I do do think that. Uh, um, something that uh, generally you see more of if you're from a family of eight, six kids. Um, what was it like backtracking? What was it like to be number six? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know if I can give you a good answer on this. I would say um, one thing is that, uh, I mean, you've talked about the verbals, you know. I would say people were, I would say it's a high achieving family, if you know what I mean. Like my sisters, they've done really, really well academically. And my brothers too, but not as well as my sister. So, because um, girls are smarter than boys. Exactly. Uh, car insurance. You know why are girls smarter than boys? Yeah. The answer is car insurance. Car insurance. Yeah. Um, That's the same with my family. The two two scholars that were the, the sisters. The and four I, boys were jocks. I was pretty lazy in school, I would say, and I kind of still am. You know, I I I'm not the greatest student in the world, but um, that sort of thing does rub off on you. And I would say this. Uh, I've always been curious about the world of politics and what's going on in the world. You know. And that's definitely in, in huge part thanks to the family that I was in. You know, like we'd be driving to, in the car, the radio would always be on, you know. News, listen to news. Yeah, and, and then the uh, watching the TV news at 9 p.m. I used to try to stay up, you know, I, I would try to stay up as long as I can. And uh, if there was a particularly, you know, it's like 9.35, a TV show called Primetime would come on. So, you know, some kids stay up late watching, I don't know. Whatever. Whatever, yeah. but I would stay off watching uh, <laughs> watching prime time. So, and one thing I would say as well, and you would acknowledge this, that I mean, I would have my reservations about the media in Ireland at the moment, but having said that, there's, it is an awful lot more sophisticated than the media in America in terms of the, the way the media here, it's very sensational, very sensationalist, and people just throw, like everyone just hates each other and everything is so dramatic. You know, they're looking at the screen with wide eyes, you know, but if you were to watch the BBC News or the RTE News, there's something a lot more dignified about it, you know? And uh, so, well, yeah, I was, I was just around that a lot, you know? I think back with Ted Turner when CNN was started and also in the news was 24 um, seven. So it's become showbiz. Exactly. Know, TV ratings and an exactly. anchor that's making $20, $20 million a year. Right. It's, it's, it's Hollywood, it's crazy. Um, with, Lessons to learn from being from a large family, um, you know, just as, but, but to, be, to be the youngest, uh, you see what pathways the older siblings take. I think birth order is really interesting. Uh, we talk about brain typing. Like, say, if you're you're an introvert, but you're in a family of eight, you're forced to, <laughs> to survive to be right. to be more extroverted. You know, Ali was teasing. Um, Ali's a girl living in in the in the tennis house at the moment. She said that I'm probably talking because I didn't get to talk at home, you know, because I was the youngest. And who, who, who cares what the youngest person has to, t has to say? No, you know? for sure. I think that, uh, <laughs> I tell people that one of the best things I've done in tennis is I took jobs where I didn't have a speaking part. But um, yes, when you're the youngest, um, you know, who, who's going to listen to you? And then, you know, the, the parents fade. Generally, the parents will fade a little bit. Um, mm. You know, they just, um, the... Um, like for myself, it was, some of it was circumstantial, but um, my older brothers were, um, they all took piano lessons. I never took one piano lesson because my three brothers had already quit. So, you know, it's one of my only athletic skills in the sixth grade. I could palm a basketball and I always tease my mom. I should have been a piano player. I mean, no, no doubt I would have, I would have done the same dumb thing. I would have quit, but uh, there was always a piano in the house and but uh, no, I wasn't taking the piano lessons. I think she was a little defeated after the right. the, the 
the three the three older brothers quit. But you did singing lessons instead, probably, huh? Um, I, Mark Hamlin, I sing so low that I, mean, I sing solo, so no one can hear you. Or I'm, I, I sing ten or ten or twelve miles down the road. But no, 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 no singing on this end. With let's go to the, um, tennis. So, how did you get from uh, back to tennis? It's from Lander to uh, Spring Hill. Spring Hill College, Al yeah, Alabama. Um, yeah. So, well, the reason I started wanting to transfer uh, was actually because I spent a summer in the Northeast, and I thought I want to go to a bigger city, basically, because it'd be more interesting, and. Now that's not, I don't know if that was a, I don't know was I right in thinking that, but anyway, that was what got those wheels kind of turning. And um, also the thing about Lander, and I have a huge amount of respect for the school, but it's not a very uh, renowned school in terms of reputation. You know, it's not like no one knows about it. And one of the things my, my parents would have thought is like, what's that going to look like having a degree from this school called Lander, you know? Um, so... There, the school that I'm at now, even though I don't think it's any better as a school, uh, it has a better reputation because it's run by the Jesuits and they have a good reputation. So there's some of that that's part of it. But uh, a guy called Mark Finnegan, who was a coach at tennis, no, not Tennessee, Memphis, assistant coach at Memphis, uh, head coach at North Florida and assistant coach briefly at Auburn. He had gone home to Ireland uh in 2018 and he had set up a recruiting business called all sports recruiting maybe i'm not allowed to publicize that or whatever but anyway no no it's fine yeah so there's just certain rules at the ncaa it's crazy strict but it's stupid stuff like that but anyway um mark uh had just set up this recruiting business and i called him and i said um i mean we got talking and one of the ways i tried to uh become more valuable was i actually started running cross country and so fall of 2018 i was the mvp on the lander cross country team and uh we came i think we came second last in our conference so well that's what so i'm talking about a, with your speed and yeah. your ability to run but did, did you run cross country as a kid at all no i ran a race every year for the for uh grades seven eight and nine i ran one race in the fall no i would have run two races East Lancer and then Lancer, so that th that would have been two races, and then, but no, I wasn't a I wasn't a serious runner, you know. But I was good at running. Um, I'm actually not as fit as I was probably when I was 16, but um, that was that, and and yeah, I, I I visited three schools, and one of them was in um, Missouri, called Lindenwood. I visited a uh, what was that school called in Philadelphia? Is there a school called LaSalle in Philadelphia? Mm -hmm. I think it was called LaSalle, yeah. And then I visited Spring Hill, and I really got on well with the captain at the time. Um, and by the time he got there, was he still there? That he the actually, time. he hadn't, he wasn't there, yeah. He, he wasn't on the team. He was graduating that fall. So, yeah, that was the case there. He was, um, yeah, so I transferred to, to Spring Hill, yeah. One thing with foreign players, um, what happens with U.S. players is they can turn their nose up a little bit at division two schools and you know many players go to a division one school and they get in over their head they don't go where they can actually play right and you know there's some american kids that the coaches sometimes are welcome with open arms because they're going to be playing all foreigners but you know it certainly looks good that they have americans uh, like you said that when you said you you didn't we're not going to make it um, at Lander, yeah. At Lander, that's being in the top six, being, right. being in the lineup. Right. With, But that's one of the reasons that foreign players will come over to the U.S. A lot of these smaller schools like um, Lander, they don't have the the budget to recruit American players where they got to wine and dine them. They're going to, you know, have, have the kid fly in to see their school, fly back to see the parents, right. go to one or two nationals. That's, that's a lot of money from a recruiting standpoint. Um, but so you actually, when you transferred, you transferred with a scholarship as well. Yeah, it was actually worked out really, I mean, um, paying less than Atlanta. I, I don't want to talk about the money there, but, uh, I got more than I deserve. I'll put it that way. Uh, yeah. Got a, got a great, a great have, deal have there. You, and have you run cross country at all? It's spring. No, haven't had to do that. No, I've run for election twice actually. So that's, um, 
And I lost twice, of course. So you, the first time, Steve, guess how many volts we lost by? Just have a guess. Three. Five volts. And uh, so that was the first year. And um, no, I think, I mean, I will say uh, I've, I've contributed to the, to the life of that school in, in a certain way, you know. And um, so, no, it's been, it took a while for me to, to uh, I mean, I, I needn't bore people with the details of, of, our, of our tennis team, but our culture is getting better. I'll put it that way. And uh, we've got a few freshmen and a few sophomores who will continue that improvement. And I'm quite excited about that, you know. So let's go back to school election. Uh, I'll tell you a quick story. When I was in maybe the sixth grade, um, I was voted the class officer to rep you go to you know one from, from one from each grade, and there'd be a meeting. And right. So a very good friend of uh, our whole family, but a uh, woman by the name of Betty Mulberry, was good friends with my mother, and it was something like there was. Uh, 61 kids voting and there was 30 boy 31 boys and 30 <laughs> girls and i got 31 votes right all the boys voted for me and none of the girls voted for for any of the boys but so yeah so your radio show your podcast running for school election running cross country um not just focused on hitting forehands and backhands yeah not spending enough time in the uh racquetball alley you know with an orange ball and uh, not not enough time shadow swinging in front of the mirror. But the the podcast is one thing that came up with you and when my parents were over here because, uh, I mean that's one of the, arguably my favorite. Th it's probably my favorite thing to do is to interview people. And for a time I was doing one a week when I was in, with you in Orlando. And I remember that. Yeah. And you and my parents were kind of saying, yeah. And my dad in particular was kind of, um, you and my dad would have said like that's a day out of your week you know you can't be you can't afford that you know taking you away from it's a it's a distraction you know that was kind of the thing about that so well i think live and let live but if you want to um really excel yeah um i mean you can't do you everything eventually you get to the point where you know it goes to go um jack of all trade master of none exactly no 100 percent um and it's unfortunate that uh you know if, if the competition is practicing five time five hours a day now you know you can't practice five hours a week right but actually when you stop and do some homework there's some great tennis players that didn't play that much tennis when they were younger mm. and it's way way overrated um you know we've talked about the movie um king richard venus stopped playing tournaments at 10. her sister serena is 15 minutes 15 months younger um, you don't have to play junior tennis tournaments, but you, you certainly have to learn to be competitive. I know many college coaches, they'd love to have a, a recruit who's taken penalty kicks or they've been in an overtime. You know, they dealt, they definitely dealt with pressure. Mm -hmm. Um, but and I think in the end, there's only one type of pressure, self-inflicted pressure where it's like, okay, you get, get up, make your bed, do some sit-ups and push-ups and you know every day is a tournament yeah every day is a tournament so with um going back to you've got one semester to go one more yeah majoring in philosophy yeah which you can apply to everything nick ball terry nick ball terry's alma mater yeah he went to spring hills yeah and with that um Career-wise, so you you know, I think that's what's very difficult for someone like yourself. You come and initially, you came to us and said, "Well, um, you want to learn more about tennis teaching." We film everyone, and even if you're not playing, we like to film teachers and have them go through the same experience with, um, be, you know, make, you know, making that transition. Uh, you're so young that to be totally wrapped up in someone else's game. But it's very difficult to um, say, okay, I'm going to uh, put all this energy into so many different things. But if you want to really excel as a tennis player, yeah, that's where I think you have to say, okay, I'm going to um, prioritize. Yeah. So career-wise, I mean, you're going to finish. You could take an OJT or OPT. OPT, yeah. It used to be called OJT, on-the-job training. 
Or yeah, stand for now. Uh, I think it's optional practical training. I think. So, so if you graduate, you get a degree, you can stay in the U.S. for a year. Yeah, you know, and we talked about helping you with some of our contacts. I mean, you could actually continue an internship with us, apprenticeship. Um, you know, being from Europe, being from Ireland, you could work anywhere in Europe. And, you know, just, it's always a recommendation. So I said today, you know, uh, why don't you focus on um, becoming the best tennis player you could be? You're an athlete, you're still young. And um, I know you've talked about one day going back, we talk about Galway, what a beautiful place, is um, to really go back and teach tennis in Ireland, mm -hmm. make an impact. But um, you could work on your game the same time put yourself where you're teaching um, learning to become a better teacher um, with with that then go to Europe like say you know Germany's a very wealthy country we've had a lot of our students we've trained have gone to Germany other countries but especially Germany with team tennis um, but that's where you know we talk about the the hourglass the sand is sipping through and but at the same time, when I'm, uh, you know, telling you that you should focus, if, you know, make your mind up. You know, what are you going to excel at? And you know, sometimes with a degree, okay, you know, you, you're going to get through, and um, you're going to get a liberal arts degree. Anderson Cooper, Cooper Anderson, CNN. It's Cooper Anderson, correct? No, Anderson Cooper. Anderson Cooper. Yeah. So, um, with I like to listen to commencement speeches, and he went to Yale, and I was listening to his on YouTube, YouTube's fascinating. And he said, liberal arts means no skills. Right. With- um, I have a little anecdote, can I share that anecdote? Yeah, go ahead. And so you're in the same boat as me here, so you can't tease me on this one, but uh, I was stopped by a woman the other day and her kid, and they asked me, they said, we need your help. And uh, their car had a flat tire. And of course, I wasn't able to change their tire because I don't know how to do that. I've never done that. You know, and neither can you, apparently. Well, so no skills. <laughs> yeah, with uh, I can't change the light bulb, but um, it's a circumstantial. I mean, I have not been in a situation where um, I've had to change a tire. It's amazing. But now then you have AAA. Right. Um, but uh, it's the principle too, though. You know, it's like it's something that I should be able to. But do, no, it's you like know? you. I know I used to go to Ireland all the time, and you, when you would rent a car, it was much more expensive to rent a, a car you didn't have to shift. Right, automatic. Automatic, yeah. and uh, you know it's actually crucial to be. You know, think about it, there's an emergency, and you get in the car, you have to take someone to the hospital, and you can't drive a stick shift. Um, but um, yeah, I know a lot of American tennis players. You know, you think. Can you string a racket? You know, you to, well, here are some things you need to do if you're going to go on the road, and right. you need to learn to. Years ago, is you had to learn to drive a stick shift. With, um, yeah, so I have to uh, add that to my my bucket list. I need to learn to change the tire. Right, it's so easy now with a cell phone. But living in the van, I'm surprised you never had any horror stories. You know, flat I have, tire. That's like another thing. You know, we talked about talking about Robert Steckley. Is that we could have a podcast. Um, I'm very proud of the fact that uh, um, one of the coaches in this classroom, they put a picture up of the van. I lived in a van for two years. Great, different scenery every day, new neighbors, uh, beat the rent. Um, the uh, life, life on the road with, um, let's get into uh, Irish tennis a little bit. Um, it's your tennis, but then Irish tennis you know, we talked about it's an island nation, small, small, small population. It's an expensive sport, and around the world is becoming more expensive. I think of it as a money grab. I was very upset with uh, the entry fee recently. The little mo, two hundred twenty-one dollars, and I know one family came to visit. Incredible. They had three kids playing. It's just like it's too, too much. Too, Where is too that money going? Yeah, it's a, yeah. Um, yeah. But most recently, um, with Irish tennis. Uh, you're the initiator of this. It was great. Uh, Dave Mullins with the Intercollegiate Tennis Association. We talked to Dave, did a podcast with Dave. He, I think he's a manage, managing director of the ITA, Governing Body of College Tennis, with um, you know, trying to reach out to help Irish tennis. That was certainly something that uh, I'll talk about. The 
couple of different things came down my pathway. But um, who, who who is the director of development now? And uh, Garrett Barry, I think, is the head coach. Yeah, so uh, tennis Ireland. Um, I did with Dave speak to him and said, "Gee, you know, if you could just come up with, uh, you know, like say four families and." And, and, and going knowing your background and having spent a lot of time in Ireland, some kid could be um, playing Gaelic football or in the backyard, they've got a hurling stick. And um, But if they just take 10 minutes, um, uh, Brandon Flanagan, for example, he um, connected with two schools here in this area, uh, kindergarten through eight, eighth grade. And you know, I would love to just sit down with the athletic director and say, hey, this is what should really be done. Right. You know, but it, he, uh, a lot of times, you know, you're a new guy on the block and it's like, who's this guy? Right. Four families coming back to like elementary schools is, is if every kid could, you teach running mechanics, you teach throwing mechanics, um, and yet you, you're very clever, but if you could just say, okay, I mean, you could say, these are the sports you're going to learn to play here. Right. And sure, you know, especially in an outdoor environment like South Florida, okay, there's no hockey rink, there's no, you don't, we're not playing football. Uh, but you can have basketball, you'd have soccer, um, you'd have running, you'd have golf, golf, you could have tennis. Um, you know, you could even have, say, lacrosse is a fast growing sport. But start to just teach skills. So what should what should happen with a young tennis kid is they really shouldn't play tennis. Right. If, like say for yourself, you you grew up and if you, you know, you um, and that, I think that's interesting about cross country. I you know, two or three people I've coached have come to mind, uh, Artie and Pogaimi and uh, from Moldova, Megan Broderick from Florida. Uh, because they just, their time was such and such, they are just good enough to be on the team. You know, with cross country, you say, no, this is, uh, this is my mile time. Right. This is my two mile time. Yeah. And then you just- There's No politics. You're, you're just good to go. Yeah. Um, but if someone like yourself was just taught and you, you know, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't even know you're being taught, it's like, okay, you want to go back over and and play ultimate frisbee. Yeah, come over here and show us that you just have these efficient swings. And a kid could be six, seven years old. That's that Einstein quote where imagination is greater than knowledge. It's kind of like coming back to Daniel Coyle. It's that you should really only hire people that are sixty, seventy years old. Right. That uh, have some experience and say, hey, th this is how you, this is how you should do it. And the, the the thing about tennis is you can make money at nineteen knowing nothing. Basically, you, you, as you know, you don't need to be qualified to make a living. That's the problem, basically. So let's go back. You work at a posh club in Connecticut. And, and so I meet you and I found out what you were paid per hour. And I said, oh, how are we going to, all re how are we going to refund all those fine people? <laughs> now you actually said you stole that money. <laughs> He's exaggerating. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Who are they going to believe? Who are they going to believe? But with uh, Dave Mullins and again, the, the director's name, Cheryl. No, no. Oh, uh, sorry. Tennis Ireland. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, sorry, Garrett Barry is the head yeah, coach. So yeah, so if, if, you know, four families and, you know, I, I've got it written, I have some names written down here and say, okay, if you were to just ask, you know, tell the four families, you know, I've got a list of 10 names down here. Um, you know, it could be 15 that we have connections with from our work and we got, you know, tennis players from Ireland. Um, with, uh, but again, like, you know, well, Again, a name like Steve Smith, uh, use my name third person. It's, it's, who is this guy? But if, if people would, if they could take time and listen to the the podcast or watch some of the courses we have online, the history of the great base, um, functional tennis. Tell us about Fabio. That's something else. Irish tennis. Fabio, I honestly, I wouldn't be the one to ask about Fabio. Um, What's his last name though? Mole or Mole, M O L L E. Yeah, function. I mean, I just know he's a, a nice guy and. He um, he has functional tennis, but he's I think he's got the biggest Instagram page in tennis or something. Right, the yeah. biggest tennis Instagram page is that what it is? And uh, he's interviewed he interviewed Joe Dwyer, who's someone that we both know. Yeah. One thing I'll say about Irish tennis, um, I mean, who the hell am I to offer my opinion on Irish on what should be done about Irish tennis? But one nice thing, and um, well, I get to that in a second, but. One nice thing about being in Ireland, sorry, being in America as an Irish tennis player is because there's not very many of us. Pretty much automatically, if you meet an, if you know another Irish tennis player in America, there's an instant willingness to help you out, and obviously that will extend to varying degrees. You know, some someone's going to help me more than another person, but like 
I know Julian Bradley. Julian Bradley knows Joe Dwyer. He he also knows Richie Martin. So I'm I can get help from Richie Martin if if I'm stuck. That that's kind of how it works. And then whenever someone comes over, that's a bit younger than me. I'm more than happy to help them. You know, we're all kind of in that same boat, which well, is really I, cool. You know. Well, I think that with like say if you're in the players' lounge at one of the pro tournaments, say the U.S. Open, more so on the men's side than on the women's side for sure. But the men get all get along. But yeah. You know, the Swedes sit here, the Colombians sit here. You know, they'll definitely have no problem sitting with each other. But yeah, it's just, you know, getting together with someone back home, whether it's the humor, yeah, and it, just what's going on back home. So I've, I've noticed that, that happens. as well with the language. Um, I find it very easy to get on with uh, British people or Australian people it, because it's just it's nothing against non-native English speakers, but because we speak English as our first language, it's just easier to communicate with a person like that, you know. And it's easier for a Spanish person to connect with a Colombian, you know, than it would be for me to connect with a Colombian or whatever. But um, you just reminded me about something. Um, I just wonder, what if this could happen? You know, Parks Tennis. Have you heard of Parks Tennis? It's no. a program. It's, it's basically where they teach tennis in public parks and it's really cheap, you know, and a lot of... In, in Ireland or yeah, all over the world? It's, it's in Ireland, yeah. I, I don't know the extent to which it's um, active now, but there have been a few Irish, like pretty uh pretty serious Irish tennis players who were introduced to tennis through something like that um now to teach at a program like that you wouldn't need any I mean you wouldn't need to know really anything about technique you know and I just wonder if what if if you could just the thing about the great base is it's a language that you can replicate right no matter where you are so it's like if if, if you could just expose it to more people um instead of just one or two or three people like that the whole beauty of the Great Base is it doesn't have to be a private lesson, you know, but you can teach 50 people at once and they're all, t they're all learning the same way, you know. So it's, um, it, it, it's a, what I think is really special about the Great Base is that it's, uh, it's, it's a product that you can just keep manufacturing over and over and over again and it just kind of ripples out, you know. Like you're obviously one person and that's, you've coached X number of people, but how many coaches have you taught? That's really what it comes down to, and then it spreads to all their players, you know. Well, yeah, and they're all over the place. Know, so biblical teaching, you know, give a man a fish or teach him to fish. Yeah. Exactly, and and the whole thing with the great base, you're not teaching someone how to be better at tennis, but it's like, oh okay, no, we're teaching people how to teach. This is this is just, it's a system, and uh, if people, yeah, people were to just watch some of that stuff online, it's like okay, it it makes sense, you know, and it's not just a whim. You know, there's an intelligence, that, and you would be the first to acknowledge someone like Nick Baltieri. He's got a gift, right? He he has a gift of of making people tennis players, but he can't pass that gift on to anybody else, right? It, it's a special gift that he. What did he say? God gave me eyes to see. Isn't that what he said, or something? God like gave that? me eyes to see tennis, but no, Nick. Yeah, I think uh, Carling Bassett you know, said, uh, "I mean, the greatest junior coach ever, and 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 maybe not the not the best pro coach because." The pro coach is paying him. With, with uh, Jim Lair, we talked to Jim about Jim, and Jim was on our podcast. Is to get a jolt from Nick Baltieri with... Um, well, that's a one person, you know? That, right, right. And, and it's not something you can... Like, if you were to teach 10 people, 10 Irish tennis coaches, if, you were to inter, if they were to intern, it could completely change the whole... the way tennis is done in, in, in the whole country, you know? It really could. Well, coming back to functional tennis is uh, Fabio. Um, I've exchanged a few emails with Fabio. I don't know Fabio either, but he seems like such an upbeat, positive guy, and he's doing a great service for tennis. But it's more of a magazine where he's interviewing all these people connected with pro tennis, whether it's a psychologist, a trainer, a player, a player's coach. And I think that's great, but um, the similarities from one pro to the next, you know, from a biomechanical standpoint. Checkpoints, yeah at the impact point, you know, you can't violate physical laws. I mean, the strings have to be facing towards the target. Um, with my first trip to Ireland, this is before I met my former wife, is I played doubles with uh, the late um, Richard Bird from Huddersfield. And um, we went to Cork, we took his car over to, we, we took the ferry over from from um, from Wales, Hollyhead um, probably, huh? Hollyhead, right? And and um, you know, being um, someone who didn't pay attention to uh, 
what my mother or my sisters liked is Waterford Crystal. This happened to me a few times when I was a teaching pro is I'd go someplace and play a tournament and they just beg you to play mixed, play three events. And I was in pretty good shape, but I should have uh, just played uh, two events. So Did we, you lose we, to your friend in the final? No, no, I, we won the doubles. Um, the, um, but no, I lost to a young Irish kid in the final. I mean, I, no excuses, but I was, uh, yeah, teaching pro. I mean, I was still, you know, maybe 27 years old, 28 years old. But they, and they, it was amazing after playing a tournament where you, you um, go have a drink with a person after you played. Right. You sit down and you go to the clubhouse and these people are being so nice. And first of all, it was a week long tournament. And on the Wednesday, middle of the week, there's a party. There's a band and there's a party in the middle of the week. It's not your style. Tournament party. <laughs> uh, yeah, I could be with, uh, you know, I can remember. We had Scotty Perelman on the podcast, coach at the University of Florida. I remember him saying, Smitty, Smitty, Smitty. I don't think you're serious enough to be a junior coach. Um, but, you know, once I started working with people and they write down, okay, they, they want to be a, um, you know, they want to be a top, top coach. They want to be a top, top player. Um, South African by the name of Greg Lussor spent three years with us. And uh, so he came in and he said, and we, we, we paid the fees and he came in, we got, got a visa for him and a very polite kid. And so he comes in and uh, he says that he'd like to go back and in leadership capacity and lead South African tennis. And so when I mentioned earlier, Chad Burial said to him, you should have never said that. And he said, why? He said, because now he's going to treat you that way. Right. With, and just to explain to people that, that means you're going to, be tough on him, basically. That's the point, right? Yeah, you're gonna yeah. make you know, get so him you to know, where he wants to go. If yeah. some kid writes down on a piece of paper they yeah. want to play Division One tennis, and their parents are paying you fees. Yeah, that's your like, job. Like, let's go to work. Yeah, and and when they write that down, um, they don't know what they're getting themselves into. <laughs> well, they they don't know. They just don't know how to get from point A to point B, and it's it's just like someone you have to honor someone who, for, for example, you know, someone's an MD or they have a PhD, and you have to really honor the fact that they survive an academic endurance trip they right. jump they jump through a lot of hoops and two climbed, climbed a lot of ladders two things you've said is a, a coach brings out a story that you wouldn't bring out of yourself isn't that isn't that one of them and then the other thing is um, that's the definition of coach i think that comes from john wooden uh, i could be wrong but i'd like to be able to say where i learned something but yeah the definition of a coach is a coach that'll bring a story out of someone that they wouldn't bring out the story themselves and then another thing you've said is um when a relationship is broken down it's when I wanted to take someone to a place that they didn't want to go. I've heard you oh, say that a few yeah, times. Oh, yeah, no, for sure. I mean, when I, if I have a falling out with someone, you know, 95% of the time it's because I tried to take them somewhere they didn't want to go. They said they wanted to go there, and it's like, we got to look, we got close, but they couldn't go any further. With uh, but going to Cork, um, so remember there was this banquet at the end of the tournament, and uh, of course, you know, they were drinking a few beers, and I had to get up and give a speech. And I thought everybody was being so nice to me because I had this big bowl. I didn't know what Waterford Crystal was. And yeah, I mean, again, I'm not a spring chicken, but I said, yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks. And it was, the, I thought the, the, the winner of the singles was a much nicer trophy. Plus, you know, it was like 400 Irish punts. Is that Pounds. right? Punts. Uh, a yeah. little money. But so um, I was, after that, I was off to Germany to teach tennis and I just left it in a friend's uh, closet in London. I was gonna travel back through London on the way back to the States. So I just carried this bowl, you know, it was in my shoulder bag and I had to get and show it at customs. And, and uh, but, but I, when I, I got it out, the woman sitting next to me went crazy. She said, let me see that. And you know, she's going, that's Waterford Crystal. And so, you know, then I, with um, the tournaments by no means were money-making tournaments. So, I told to take it to a store, and I'm told it's worth like eight hundred dollars. Wow! I'm going eight hundred dollars. So didn't think much of it. So I put it in the closet, and I'm just throwing pennies in it. So then my mother shows up, and um, I'm a bachelor, single guy, and she helps me. And I, I'm pretty much a neat freak, but she waxes a table and puts this Waterford crystal on the table, and there's some flowers in it, and. Oh, you know, eventually the flowers die and I throw the flowers away, but the crisp, the waterproof bowl is still right there on the table. 
And weeks go by, and then I'm vacuuming. I hit it with a vacuum. It just slid and just boom, broke. <laughs> so, that, Steve, what's the part of the story? The, the, um, you should know what Waterford Crystal is. <laughs> the, uh, now, they're still going strong, that Waterford Crystal? Yeah, I mean, as far as I know, it's, it's uh, still, still in existence, yeah. But the, um, that's another thing, too. It's such a small country, but people don't travel that much. They don't really travel. Um, I know they have their summer circuit, but... Um, what do you mean travel? In other words, you stay pretty close to home. It's not, you know, like you're not... That kid from Cork is not going to go to D Dublin all the time. No. Or has that changed? Well, it depends. I mean, when you say go to... Uh, I don't know. I'm trying to compare it to... What would you compare it to here, you know? But um, I would certainly say here the, the car... People are definitely more... Driving is far more common here, you know. Like, for example, my brother is 20, what age is he, 26. And uh, he can't drive. Like, he doesn't have a driver's license. That would be unthinkable in America, you know. Well, Like, yeah. it's, it's no big deal we're, we're, to drive. We're, we're, we're definitely a car society. Yeah, and, and then another thing you would, I would say is, um, like, yesterday I drove uh, from Mobile, Alabama to Boynton Beach, right? That's, uh, I don't know, six or 700 miles. You know, that's... Long, that's you cannot drive that amount in Ireland. You know, it's just not possible. Things just aren't as spread out as they are here, you know, so. Well, if you make a U-turn and go back north. Right? Yes, but <laughs> that's true. But yeah, I mean, top to bottom of the country is probably, I don't know, six or seven hours, you know, so. With, but going back to being in Cork, the price of gas, right. price of tennis balls. Right. Everything's so expensive. Yeah. Everything's so expensive. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, when things are cheaper, you just, buy more than here don't you isn't that well, kind a, of there's yeah, so much waste volume on our side yeah with um but ireland's becoming more like that too you know like the the big shopping malls out on the in the middle of nowhere you know with the main massive parking lots you know people have this image of the little thatched cottage and the i don't know the sheep or whatever you know the small farm but that's just the nature of the world you know the it's more efficient to produce bigger things and uh and the, and the little man kind of disappears when that when that kind of thing happens, like the whole mom and pop thing. I mean, you it's it's more extreme here. Like you see, um, I used to just get sad every time you drive through a tiny little town and the, and the little downtown area. It's beautiful, but it's completely deserted. You know, and the shops are pretty much boarded up. And then two miles away is the highway, and you've got McDonald's, Zaxby's, Arby's, Burger King. Yeah. You know, Whataburger and all the rest. And every single town effect pretty much. It's just a carbon copy of the next, you know? Like, there's nothing specific to the actual yeah, place. Yeah, I know. You know? One, one of my sisters doesn't like to go to what I would call a franchise restaurant. Right, right. And, you know, it's like, the, yeah, the guy, gal, who are running the corner hardware store. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's just the way, yeah, it's the way of the world, you know? Yeah, but now, pretty soon, people aren't even going to, they're not even going to go to shopping. They're just going to, everything's just going to be shipped. on Amazon, yeah. Shipped to their house. Yeah. One thing in America, Steve, um, I couldn't get over the drive through banks, you know, that's a, uh, I mean, everything is drive through here as well. You know, you don't even have to get out of your car. If no, you I, can, I can it's remember, terrible. Uh, <laughs> I talked to Taki Marita the other day, great guy. He spent time with us studying English, playing tennis. You know, he had to pass the total test and it's certainly much more difficult for a Japanese student because they don't start with the alphabet. A test on English fluency. And uh, we were talking about Maru Hiromichi-san. <laughs> Right. who's famous now in Japan, uh, the famous wheelchair player. Uh, Maru, who spent a lot of time as an intern like you you are with us, um, came over to study tennis. But I can remember just going through a drive through and Maru's in the car, and he was just shocked. Yeah. That you could, you know, that, that's probably one of the best ways to define that we're a, we're a car society. Right. The, um, you know, we, should, we could talk about the Jesuits. I'm always saying that, you know, like, like the Jesuits, just give us the first the first uh, seven years when it comes to tennis teaching. My son, Mikhail, went to a Jesuit school. And at one point, it was a wealthy, you know, probably even one of the more expensive. It's not that expensive in comparison to others, but in Tampa, it's, it's one of the most expensive high schools. And I remember I him telling me one time, he was a young kid, he goes, everybody has three cars. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we talked about uh, Raven Kloss and just the other day because uh, I was introducing you to Gabe Wapner and um, Brandon Flanagan who trained with 
Raven. Raven was just shocked that a 16 year old kid in America could have a car. Right. And you know, actually, when the parents set up a 16 year old, it's it's just the it's just the way way America works because mm-hmm. then the parents have jobs and okay, yeah. you know, you're you're you you can go five miles down the road from high school to your tennis practice and. Um, you know, it, it comes down to that there's so much land, you know, like say you, in Japan, um, you know, everybody's going this way. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I work with a Japanese player, they say, okay, what floor do you live on? You know, they, sometimes they'll say 26th floor. Yeah. And uh, like here in Florida, I think that you see most of the, most of the apartments are only three, uh, three levels because if it's four, you have to have an elevator. With, um, but Irish tennis, um, it, no, it was always intriguing to me to, to try to help the Irish just because I was brought up, you know, proud to be Irish. Yeah. So um, I was training tennis teachers and I started communicating with John Taylor and your mother set me straight. I thought he was a squash player, but she said he was a badminton player. So it was interesting because your mother knew him. He was in charge of Irish tennis. So at that time, um, you know, you mentioned when uh, your mother interviewed Macron, that was in 1983. Um, through John Taylor, there was no national coach, but I was offered to be the national coach of Ireland. They had no money. Um, but there's only two indoor courts. And so two, I'm, I'm just thinking two indoor courts and it rains every day. That's right up my alley. Okay, take the role of the underdog. I'll take that job. And I look back, I think of uh, Bob Larson, who has, had so much to do with job placement, had his own publication, maybe he still does, with Bob Larson's tennis, is that... Um, that, you know, once you get connected, um, the, um, but I can remember meeting with John and that's back when Fitzwilliams, your national tennis center, would you call it the national tennis center? Yeah, we wouldn't, we probably didn't have a national tennis center. You know, that's, well, it was the de facto center. Yeah. Well, Fitzwilliams, it was all, it was, it was grass courts. Yeah. It was not the artificial grass today. And what a, what a beautiful facility, but, um, the, um, that for the longest time, the Irish, um, we say Irish Tennis Federation, Irish Tennis, they really followed the, the, the LTA. And the LTA was at one point criticized. And I remember it went back to my birth year, so it was very easy to remember. They hadn't made any changes since 1954. And this is like 30 years later. Right. Um, Louis Caille, he came in after that. So I, I didn't um, take John on. Now, if I had done that, I would have been. Louis Caillet was in Ireland or in Britain? No, he's in Britain now where he's a double specialist, but he, um, he put together something that was called the action. Method. Right. And they followed that. And is that what you're saying? So that became Irish tennis. Yeah. And I had, I had a lot to do with training Canadians that were, they would, they would actually, you know, travel to wherever I was, uh, mostly in Florida to help them. Uh, they had f- five different levels. I know Miran Mann, one of our podcasts talked about the certification process in Canada. Now Louis, uh, hasn't worked for Tennis Canada for a long time. But, um, you know, I remember uh, one time being scheduled to do a coach's clinic for John Taylor. And I can't remember, I think maybe the, the Irish Davis Cup team had beaten Norway. And therefore, they were going to play Egypt or the BD Egypt. They were going to play Norway. And then it was all hands on deck. Right. But I remember going to his office and he didn't have a full time secretary, he had a part time secretary. And it was in the basement um, of one of those row houses right by old Fitzwilliams. And, you know, as an American, it's kind of like, you know, looking at a, a mountain in, in England. I was like, well, this isn't the Rockies. But it, you know, Snowden or Ben Nevis, uh, Snowden in Wales and Ben Nevis in Scotland, it's a pretty tough climb. No matter what you're doing, it's a pretty tough climb, no matter what program you're, you're trying to make. But, um, you know, so I just think about you, you with tennis is that we can come back as if one day you indeed wanted to go back and coach in Ireland, you know, what are you up against when you do something like that is you touched upon it earlier as a 19 year old doesn't have to know much or anything about tennis and you can start to give lessons. That's because the consumer is not educated. The consumer, the parent in junior tennis, they think there's a shortcut and the glorified sparring partner, I always say in boxing, you wear a, if you're the sparring partner, you wear a helmet and a mouth guard and you don't say anything. 
But in tennis, when you're that sparring partner, you're, you're grossly overpaid for just hitting balls. But also, I would, I would, I mean, to, to be, I would say a lot of the customer doesn't really want to, they don't want to become a serious tennis player a lot of the time, right? Like they do want a service, like the, the service that they're looking for isn't really good tennis instruction, even though you sort of owe it to them, right? If you're being paid that much money. But they kind of just, a lot of the time, they just want to have fun. And, and that's why it kind of works. Do you know what I mean? Even though it's, it's, maybe well, not, I, it's not right necessarily, but that's, that's why it happens. You know, it's, well, it does work. But I, it, you know, like your, your credit where credit's due. Um, Jeff Lewis, I remember Jeff Lewis. So, you know, he's down there. He's, he's, he's along the road in years now. But, um, you know, maybe I've known Jeff uh, 22, 23 years. And, you know, you could take Seattle, you could take Syracuse, you could take Shreveport, and everybody protects one another. Is Everybody's doing the same thing. Mm. You got the card of balls and you're pumping out balls. Right. And, um, you know, I remember just saying, well, if one person started videoing and doing pre-post videos, maybe the next person exactly. would do that. Um, yeah. So competition, is, it's not as healthy as you would, would think it is um, with... Um, but the... You know, you compare teaching tennis or learning tennis to learning swimming. Mm. You know, granted, swimming is a life-saving skill. But I just think that um, if you're going to look a kid in the eye, you, you're ta they're taking tennis lessons. Is let's teach them how to play tennis. Right. And I think the respect level is 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 gone out the window. And, right. And um, but now you're in the vast vast minority. Mm -hmm if you're truly trying to teach a young kid. And, um, you know, we do the opposite is we don't market to the child. Let's make it fun. Let's right. make it repeat business. Let's have them want to come back. Mm -hmm. Is that you market to the parent. I think, I think parents should say, okay, child, son, daughter, um, you choose one sport, we'll choose another. And, and I think the parent many times would, would teach it, would, would choose a carryover sport. Mm -hmm. Maybe swimming, you can do it all your life, or golf, you do it all your life, tennis. Um, with, but you know, for me, I'm at that point. You know, I think if you have four laps in life, I'm definitely on the last lap. And you know, reflective thought, people say, "Well, I don't have any regrets." I think everyone has regrets. But if I could turn the clock back and say, "Gee, you know, I, w I went to Ireland." Um, I think anywhere you go, you fight battles, mm. and if to win those battles in tennis. You have to get people to win. They're not going to listen to science, logic, or imagery. You got to get people to win. Mm. But then what happens in tennis, and that's where it could be very, uh, it'd be, it could be done easier in a place like Ireland. Like right here in South Florida, this is one of the worst places in the world to teach tennis. In some ways, it's the best, but one of the best. Because people keep chopping and changing, basically, isn't that it? Yeah, the shop and bop, and yeah. the, um, but the theory of isolation. At one point, um, Dave Anderson, I know you've connected with on the phone. Dave Anderson, and Craig Tiley, and I were um, thinking about being based out of Salt Lake City, beautiful place. Uh, another time I was, uh, Lifetime, the people of Lifetime were talking to me, they have eight indoor clubs. And I go, you know, that's the, that's the outback. Minnesota, hardy people. It's like, okay, go to Minnesota and produce tennis players. Uh, we had a, you know, father, daughter, uh, just last week, it was great fun for us to have them come down, and we hope to help the daughter more with her tennis. And I said to him, well, if they can produce tennis players in Moscow, why can't they produce tennis players in Minneapolis? It's freezing in both places. Like, let's just stop and think what's going on. And um, capitalism's not perfect. You know, you just sit around a tennis meeting, and it's just all about money. You know, I'm in the wrong room. Is this, you know, it's just all about money. And, um, you know, granted... People have to make a living, but uh, that's another thing too, is the, the money grab. With um, coming back to being interviewed, um, you know, I remember you saying it to me one time, okay, I said, hey, tell us about the podcast. And, and you were saying that you think it would be better if I was being asked questions instead of the other way around. Right. But um, we could do a little bit of that, but let me, let me do this um, with uh, some names, just some stories. Um, the Dervla Kelly, 
I used to struggle with Durbla Kelly, just pronouncing her first name, but she was an Irish junior champion and she was sent to work with us. And granted, she did quite well in the artificial grass. So then she comes over and she's on clay, mm -hmm. American clay, the hard true. And she comes over and it's the summertime and it's like a sauna. <laughs> it is, you know, someone from Ireland has never experienced that type. If it's their first time, yeah. it is like being in a sauna. And, you know, she's an Irish junior champion. She's a good tennis player, but she's playing against young kids and not doing so well. So we, we had, would have all that on film where she, she made these changes in her game. Um, Check your ego at the door. That's what you say. Yeah, you know, you go through skill testing and um, the, uh, we have uh, Sinead McCain. Um, say that right? Sinead. Sinead. You say that's, that, a, that's a better pronunciation. Sinead. Yeah. Siobhan, Sinead, Irish names. With um, a physical therapist, um, she directed the Harvard Tennis Camp. Uh, Brandon Flanagan, he's somebody. Uh, Chad Barrell, these people that we've mentioned their names. Uh, for 12 years, we our curriculum was used by the Harvard Tennis Camp. Uh, it's funny, she came over and, and she, she did an in internship. And uh, so my son Connor came to visit. You know, he used to out traveling, playing tennis. and. Uh, so they, they knew each other from having played mixed doubles. And at that time, I had made a pre-post video. And I was, Sinead, I was giving a hard time. I said, that's why my son is not where he should be. He played mixed doubles with you. Your backhand volley killed his confidence. Um, with uh, Stuart Doyle. Stuart Doyle was uh, an assistant to Craig Tiley. Craig Tiley's team won the NCAAs. I think if uh, Jeff Lasky wasn't listening to... Uh, Stuart Doyle, and they're about the same size, and Doyle has a little bit of rugby in him. He grabs Lasky by the shoulders and headbutts him. <laughs> you know, so Doyle really helped Tylee, um, just with how everybody responded to him. Do you, can you tell that story about him in the car and the, and the radio? Do you mind telling that story? Yeah, so Stuart Doyle, um, he's, he gets lost, and, but he's... he's finally finds where he has to go. For, he got an MBA and he's working in the U.S. and he gets his first day on the job. And he, not only did he lost, but he, he, just, he stays in the car. And so I guess the person, uh, you know, recognized him in the car and then he, he didn't come in for the longest time. And they said, why didn't you come in? He goes, oh, my favorite song was on the radio. So he had to listen to the, listen to the song play out. And, but, he, but the thing was, he was reprimanded and he was late the next day. But um, Stuart Doyle, I mean, he was, I guess, in the 12s. He was just phenomenal and he had wins over Tim Henman. And, but he actually showed up at my place all years later and, you know, married and with kids and bringing his kids to Florida to go to Disney, Disney World in Orlando. So he shows up and he wants to have a video made. He, he had seen me make videos for these Illinois players, and and uh, he said, "Could you make a video for me?" And he said, "I want to find out why I couldn't play at, the, at a real high level." Um, with um, this, these Irish names, Owen Casey, I don't know Owen Casey. I've met him, but what a great fighter! But so Owen Casey had these Irish names. I, I'm the director of the junior college national tournament, and it's one of the recons from Bolivia. And there's two brothers, um, Mario, I'm not sure of the name of both of them. So Steve Ulrich went on and became famous as an umpire. You know, now he still, he travels and he works with, uh, you know, like putting the, what is it, uh, the Mac cam, what do you call it, the machine that calls the lines? Um, Hawkeye. Hawkeye. So as you get a little bit older, your eyes go. So he's not in the chair, but even he's called with Wimbledon, the U.S. Open, all these finals. So... He was a student. All our students, we were running the tournament. In fact, Craig Tiley, who people say he's, um, you just hear over and over again, he's a tournament director, best tournament director in the world. But I can remember him uh, for several summers, you know, being an intern, being a, a student assistant, or a, I mean, a, a grinder, a right hand man, and helping run that national tournament. So o Owen Casey and one of the Recon brothers, it just got out of hand. This is in Tyler? Tyler, it was at Nationals. It just got out of hand. 
And uh, I can remember the athletic director said, um, we're going to have to call this. And I said, you can't. I said, I'll take care of it. You know, go call the match because it is going to determine who, who wins the whole team event. So, um, I, you know, you know everybody in a small town when you're there 10 years. So um, I went, I mean, I just went over and I just singled to the police officer and he came over to talk to me and said, get another police car here. And, um, it, it was, you know, this is my hockey background. It seemed like a fight was going to break out. So these two guys go out and I said, I'll tell you what, no more rules. USTA, NJCA, no more rules. We're playing by my rules. And I did use a little profanity. And I said, the next one, whoever messes up next, loses. And I'm, you know, I'm in tournament director. I'm wearing a coat and tie and I'm standing at the net post. And, and uh, at that point, it was like, forget tennis. I have to come back to my hockey background. And, but anyway, Owen Casey, um, he, he went on from junior college. And, and um, 99% sure he played for uh, Chuck Reese. And then he yeah, went on. Yeah, Clemson, yeah. And he had a very good record with um, Davis Cup. Oh, he's got a he's got he got some special award uh, for the Davis Cup. He he has some like not just within Ireland but even worldwide. He's got an incredibly pr- impressive and he's been record. He's a highly acclaimed coach in Ireland, right? Yeah, I mean he's coached. I'd say at least you can check this online, but probably twenty national champions in Ireland. You know, and um, I remember that was. Uh, I showed you a video of, of one of his players hitting the ball and you said, well, yeah, that's that's certainly above the industry norm. I remember you saying that. Um, I showed you a video of Dave O'Hare's recruitment video, actually. That was what it was. I don't it's know if you remember that. but um, The redhead, he yeah. went to Memphis. Uh, I remember yeah. talking to him. I was at a challenger with my son and he was playing with Salisbury. Right. And everybody was being really nice to him. All oh, these guys from Memphis and, you know, it wasn't, they're from USC or Stanford and they're from Memphis. And Memphis now is, you know, Actually, I think they've been top 20 for many, many years now. But um, with, um, so, you know, some tidbits here. With Ireland, many times what we do is we'll tell kids on a rainy day, okay, name a player, pro player, name a college, name a country, um, tell stories. Garrett Dorn is the younger brother of John. and He went to Harvard, graduated from Harvard, and it's, it's really cool. He tells people, yeah, they go, oh, you went to Harvard? Yeah, because I'm the dumbest person who ever went there which I think is a great icebreaker. Um, he just never, he was so tough and he said, oh, I don't need sleep. And I mean, be, but he just never conquered the backhand. You know, the unknown territory. He never, this is Gareth? Gareth, he never got yeah. the racket below the ball. But, um, you know, he, uh, then, but the older brother, John, um, Stuart Doyle tried to get John to come and work with me and it never happened. Um, you know, John played at Harvard with James Blake, and then he later went back and got an MBA. But I was at a tournament, and I just introduced myself to him. So he, he was like three or four days away, or three or four weeks, I guess, away from um, taking a job in the real world. Right. But he continued to play Davis Cup, and he made these changes in his game. But I remember um, it probably took me to... Uh, you know, one thirty in the morning to convince him, you know, but he, you know, he came over, I remember Ryder to Hart, of course it was on clay and Ryder to Hart, you know, as a senior, you know, he really didn't ride his bicycle over, but the, the high school, I just add that to the story, a little, oh, yeah, little yeah. embellishment that, uh, yeah, he just rode his bike over from this high school. that was five miles away and they play on clay. So we have that on film and, um, you know, and it was fair enough because he was in town playing a clay court tournament. Um, Ryder beat him, right? It, well, you know, when we have a, an assessment in that tape, he, he, he beat him. And um, with, um, but I think that's the case many times with a player is they find out what they really need to work on way too late. So, um, you know, he definitely had some holes in his game. Um, I don't really know Joe Dwyer. I met him. I remember sitting next to him. He coached uh, Anderson Reed, who played college tennis with my son, but tell us a little bit about Joe Dwyer. He's a personality. Joe is electric, is a word that everyone would use to describe him. I've been on the court with him for only probably three or four or five hours, maybe. Uh, he spent a lot of time in the States. He used to um, travel with Conan Island, and he worked a lot with James McGee. So our two top-ranked ever Irish players. If if you don't count Matt Doyle, I see his name written down. Matt Doyle's not really Irish, but... um. 
And he also... Are you saying I'm not really Irish? Uh, I am actually, yeah. Sorry. But uh, <laughs> my good friend Julian Bradley, um, he took up tennis really late. But when he was in his late teens, he kind of decided, I really want to play tennis, like seriously, you know. And so uh, Joe once started talking to him at a, at a senior open at Carrick Mines. Uh, you probably played that tournament, did you? Carrick Mines? No, you only no. played. Anyway, uh, so Joe is the kind of guy, he'll start talking to anybody who will listen. He's one of those guys who could just talk all day long, you know. And But Julian really listened, and he started taking notes about what Joe was telling him. So Joe, I think, was describing playing through the margins and the grid, you know. A lot of the same stuff that you would talk about. He's not the same sort of technician, you know, that you are, but he really knows tennis, you know, in, in terms of tactics and all those other things. So, uh, Julian... He has, and, he has a great delivery system, too. Oh, and gets people listening Incredible to energy, yeah. Oh, crazy energy. Just unbelievable. So... His name comes up when you start talking to people about Irish tennis. And people just laugh, you know, because he's, cause he's such a character, you know. But so Julian uh, and Joe developed a sort of a bond. And so whenever Julian would have a holiday, like from school, when he was at North Florida, he would uh, just rock up and spend time with Joe. And so Julian ended up getting to 300 and something in doubles in the world, you know. And this is a guy, he took up tennis at 14. Um, I think he got to 900 and something in singles, maybe. So... He would say a lot of that was, I mean, he would give a huge amount of credit to Joe. You know, Joe's one of those guys, you know, there's, you would, you would know this to be true. In tennis, there's a lot of people who just really are in it for the money, you know, and they're just in it for the nice Ferrari or whatever, you know, or you're not driving a Ferrari, but, you know, the BMW, let's say. But Joe's one of those guys who just really cares, you know, and he's just a great person. You know, he's got a massive heart. And, um, yeah, I think he's, uh, He's a special person, you know. I, I just wish I uh, I wish I could spend more time with him on the court, you know. But I guess I'm here. So this is... <laughs> I'm, I'm well looked after here, you know. There's so many different names. Brita Claffey, Elm Park. So, so if somebody rocks up and they fly into Dublin, can you still go to... Am I saying that right? ELM? Yeah, Elm. Yeah. And you, that you can rock up. And uh, I went over there many, many times. And you can just pay a few dollars and get on a grass court. Yeah, I don't know how it works. Um now Adam Park but yeah yeah it's still there I mean there's still grass courts and they actually have a bubble too so yeah since you were there that's one thing that's definitely changed there's definitely more indoor oh, yeah. indoor tennis you know yeah no I've taught in bubbles um, out in the country though there are courts yeah and I can remember um, when John Taylor was in charge I was in Ross Common in an athlete a small town and I rode the bike 50 miles to this meet with him in Galway wow and uh, you know, I'm in my late twenties, and so um, I get to the hotel, and you know, this is long before it's um, cell phones. And there's a note in my mailbox at the hotel that uh, he's not going to be able to make it. Oh my god! <laughs> but 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 the thing was is that you know I was there, so I w was watching this national junior tournament, and um, they're playing on tarmac in the rain, <laughs> entire playing in the rain now. Yeah. Um, my son Connor was playing the Irish Open, like Patrick McEnroe, you know, they, the McEnroe family, they met Harry Ottman and Davis Cup was so important to him. And John obviously was good enough to play. And they didn't, the family didn't know, um, there's three brothers, Mark, who's a lawyer. He, he didn't play competitive tennis as extensively as obviously John and, and Patrick, Patrick the youngest. So Patrick went to Ireland, but that's when it was on real grass. And of course, he had grown up playing a lot of tennis at uh, Forest Hills um, and had all this opportunity to hit with his brother's practice partners and his brother. And so he wins the Irish Open. And the, the idea that he, you know, he couldn't play for the U.S., he would play for um, Ireland. So my son went over. In fact, um, he stayed with the Duran family, John and Gareth's parents. And, and Doran, Doran, yeah. Doran, yeah. Doran. Played hockey with a kid named Doran. So anyway, um, the uh, it's in the finals, and it starts to rain. He's playing against Sam Barry. Yeah, and it's uh, you. You were probably there playing the twelves or something, right? Yeah. What What year? Can you remember the year? Connor's well, born in 1990, so 2008. Is that yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. I was under 10. I was age nine. So, I made it to the quarterfinals that year. There you go. So so uh, 
Um, so Connor, he grabs his bag and starts running to the clubhouse. <laughs> and they go, where are you going? And, Get back out there, yeah. Um, you know, it, it would have been a nice nice feather in your cap for him to be the junior champion of Ireland. But Yeah, he lost in the final, huh? But with that, um, Connor Nyland, who uh, played, and he played at Cal Berkeley first. He, I think he still is the Davis Cup captain. I think so, yeah. Um, yeah. My son Connor with his red hair, um, it's his decision, but uh, I would have liked to have him say yes. He was asked to be on the Irish Davis Cup team. Right. He was good enough to be a practice partner on the U.S. team, but uh, you know, but when a kid gets to be that old, what's well, your choice? And uh, I think that would have been fantastic um, if he had said yes. Um, you know, you mentioned Matt Doyle. I had him down. Um, he's he's lived in Ireland all these years later, but he's a kid from California. In the '80s, he played Davis Cup for Ireland. Right, and that was the famous t- time they played uh, against America. As you know, we yeah, were in yeah, the Mackinac, Yeah, I think America were at a low point. Right, and Ireland were at a high point. They were it was some sort of relegation promotion thing or something. Well, that that's where we case? that's where we need the the late Bud Collins. Um, um, your question: So was it, was Ireland in the World Group? I mean, I mean how did, might, how did it, we end up playing against it? You know, it, um, it doesn't seem right, but. I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, you'd have to look that up. Yeah. Uh, did the U.S. drop down? Something like that, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. I would think the safe bet would be the U.S. dropped down yeah. out of the world group, which is, I think, 16 teams at that time. Probably a name that I should have mentioned first is uh, Aoife Wilson. Um, I remember when she first came over. She was a student of mine in this two-year program. And you're, you're in Alabama. She actually played there, and then she went to Alabama. She went back to... Um, Ireland and I was her guest and she set it up where I worked with the Irish coaches, um, her and, and Brita Claffey. Um, she's coaching in California now. She's working with Steve Roberts. Um, the, but she actually, after two years, you know, playing junior college tennis on a, back in those days, Tyler Junior College, I actually think to this day, they're very, very strong and they're knocking on the door all the time to win a national title. In, ju- in JUCO, in junior college tennis. But she went on and played at Alabama. Then after that, she did an internship. Um, it might have been what you're talking about, OPT, OJT, and um, with with me, but then she worked for Braden. Um, She's in one of his videos, or a few of the videos. that. Yeah, not using your legs on the backhand side. Yeah, yeah, um, but that. she was very much like you as far as your level of play. Mm-hmm. But when she came over, um, I think you could say that just to, with every everyone has to go back to the drawing board a little bit, but um, she totally you know rebuilt her game. Um, with um, one thing about Irish tennis, unless you did, you have a thought or no, no, go ahead. so um, just a little anecdote is uh, my mom remembers watching. I'm pretty sure it was Margaret Court versus uh, who's who would have been playing in the finals against Margaret Court, Billie Jean King, maybe. Yeah, someone else. Uh, can you try again? Another name. Yvonne Gulaga. No, try again. So, uh, Virginia Wade. Yes, that's it. I think Margaret Court and Virginia Wade played the Wimbledon final. And then the same year, they played again in the Irish Open final, like a week or two later or something. And the, the one who lost the Wimbledon final won the Irish Open final. And the reason I bring that up is just to say, like, it's unthinkable that the world number one or, or number two could be playing the Irish Open. You know, like Irish tennis used to be especially before all the money came into tennis, Irish tennis was sort of like connected to, it was a natural crossover. You'd play Wimbledon and then you'd come over and play the Irish Open. And you actually had Rod Laver play the Irish Open. Yeah, but the men, uh, again, tennis history, uh, my recollection, I have total recall, I recall totally what I want to, is the men played in Ireland first. Mm. They played the Irish Open leading up to To the Wimbledon. Wimbledon, yeah. To Wimbledon. Yeah, and, and actually there's a few Irish men who won, or there's at least one Irish man who either won Wimbledon or got to the final of Wimbledon, like before 1900, way back. And he actually was a murderer, apparently. So if you look up uh, the list of Wimbledon men's champions or runners up or whatever, and look at the guy who's from Ireland. He, he was involved in a mysterious murder. So there you go. We need to have the... The, um, 
w- one more thing I'll say about the, the microscope on that. Look that up. Right. One more thing I'll say about the history is um, you may know that uh, sometime, I don't know, was it the 70s or the 80s, but Australia, for whatever reason, thought, okay, this is this artificial grass. It's the next big thing. So they made all their courts artificial grass. And I think a lot of the courts in Australia still are, right? But not all of them, obviously. Now, Ireland did the same thing. We're, we're, we're a country who we see someone else do something and we think, oh, we better do that. It's the same in so many aspects of of our of Irish life and Irish thinking. There's that sort of infer- inferiority complex, you know. So we changed all the courts to AstroTurf, it's called. But we never we never changed out of it. Uh, you know, like pretty much all of... Uh, pretty much all the clubs in Ireland still have those courts and they're really the only thing they're good for is that you can play in the rain and they're also good for your knees or they're not as hard on, on your knees as hard courts are but uh, they're terrible for developing tennis players because the ball bounces low and the balls get kind of wet and, and like you hurt your arm or whatever So, and you can just get by by hacking at the ball you know Um you don't get found out like you do on a hard court or a clay court. So that's one thing definitely that as, as time goes on um, and as the courts, as more people start using the artificial clay courts, which are cropping up in Ireland now, I think naturally the stroke production will have to get better because, you know, if you can't hit a ball, you get away with it on a grass court. You get found out on clay. I mean, that's one thing I discovered coming over here. I used to win a lot of matches in junior tennis in Ireland just by hacking and, and just hustling, you know, just making balls, running, running, running the ball down. And guys would miss, you know, they just, um, John McGann would call it slap town, you know. Uh, but then I got over here and, and these guys have a basic level. The people playing in, 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 that, in that level that I was playing at, uh, Division 2 at Lander, like all the guys have, they have what I have in terms of the being able to put the ball in, but they can actually hit the ball pretty well too, you know. So I was just, I was way out of my depth, you know. So well, I do think the that, surface is a big thing. I think uh, it's such a bonus to uh, to grow up on clay. Yeah, like McEnroe, for example, he was a baseliner. Mm. He was a baseliner. Uh, Man- Manolo Santana just passed away a couple of days ago. He said that uh, grass is for cows, but yet he went on and won Wimbledon and won the U.S. Open. And, you know, the singles champion. Yeah. Uh, actually, Newcomb said about Santana, is, Labor gets all the credit for revolutionizing the game, hitting topspin. But he, he chipped a lot of returns. And he came in all the time. It was, you know, granted, Labor could hit the topspin backhand, but it was Santana that was hitting topspin on everything. It's a really, really tennis in history. And he's given credit for um, inventing the one-handed topspin lob mm. where you actually lean back and you have an open racket face, but you, because of the position of the racket face, you change the angle, the racket path, and um, right. te- actually teach people how to hit a, a one-hand topspin lob. It's interesting to say, okay, here's a guy who's been given credit for that shot. But no, he, Santana... Um, He's the one who's given credit for putting Spanish tennis on the map. I mean, long before Nadal, who's just like out of this world as far as being a class champion. Um, But we started off with the idea that maybe we could do this uh, uh, another time. But let's go with a few questions. I, you, uh, you know, you asked if to uh, interview me. Um, Let's. Go with a few questions. Uh, I know we with our podcasts, um, we get a lot, we get a, we get quite a bit of feedback, and you know some people say, "Oh, they're so long," but we've had it's amazing. We have people who said they like the platform. You know, our, I mean, Instagram is like a one minute clip, and we're just we're trying to get content out, trying to as Andy Fitz always say, give value. Uh, hopefully, some of the things we've talked about. Before you ask questions, though, I think that. Um, for someone like yourself, career planning, if you, you know, if that's something that you decided to do, um, is to pursue a career as a tennis teaching professional, um, you know, to go back and make an impact on Irish tennis, um, it's not a simple task to um, build a program, build a culture, and get people to listen, get people to change get people to unite, get people to work together. Um, but at best, it really starts grassroots level. And 
you know, someone, if someone had that goal that I'm going to, um, and, I, and again, I think, I think back to, you know, I, I could have, could have done that. I could have gone to Ireland actually through Welby Van Horn and uh, Philip Eisenberg, uh, Philip owned Welby's camp. Philip put it together where I was offered to be the national coach in Puerto Rico. And by that time, married two little kids or so much travel. Um, but to do something like that is, you know, 10, 15 years, you know, and it's just like, it's just like, you know, being the farmer or being the gardener, you know, you know, we, we say trench pro, you got to get out there and build something and you got to go down, you got to build a foundation before you go back up. And, um, but that would be a journey. Um, if that's something that you wanted to do, but also too, like you mentioned, Galway, a beautiful place in the West of Ireland. And, uh, you can make it happen there, but it's, it'd be a matter of, okay, real estate component, getting tied in with the school, and then the complete athlete, and starting with people at a really young age. And the, coming back to the Jesuits, the first seven years, so you start with a five-year-old, mm. because people are going to have to get to Dublin to have better competition, and then people are going to have to leave Dublin to get to better competition. So... I don't think it's a matter of being the third base coach. It's like, okay, we are going to give these kids a great start in tennis. Right. But go ahead, a couple of questions, and we'll wind, wind this thing down. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, just I, I'd love to ask you a few questions about your background. Um, it's perfect. So you spoke about your father. Tell us a bit about his uh, his generation and, and all the other dads in your town and, and how that might be relevant. Their, kind of, their, their background. Yeah, I talk about that often where... Uh, I can't name a friend from my um, early days whose father was not in World War II. And it's sad that any time on planet Earth there's been a war. The men never talked about the war. And I mean, tennis camps at that time for me, ice hockey camps, it, you know, people use the term militant now, but there was an influence uh, where you have to make your bed and the sheets, the, 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 the counselors would drop a coin, a quarter on the sheet, you'd have to bounce and, and you know, you have to, I remember going to hockey school in Toronto and they would take the old, uh, not hurling, but curling rinks and just put up plywood and bunk beds. And um, you, you just, you know, here's the, here, a kid, here's the broom. And you, you put a kid to work. Um, but no, I just think principle. Um, with um, the, I remember... Uh, I pushed uh, this kid, Danny Ziff, off the bleachers. You know, the, the bleachers that go all the way in. We're just wrestling, and we're in a gym, and and um, this is a great story. So Danny Ziff just lands flat, wins knocked, knocked out of him, made a thump, and every, I mean, I was frightened. Everybody was frightened, like, is he dead? And so Max Buckley, he was the athletic director, and he used to just take his ring and turn it the other way, and he whacked me across the head. And... Um, so I go home like any little boy, and I told my mommy, Mommy, Mr. Buckley hit me today. There used to be a cartoon, Wait Till Your Father Comes Home. And um, so my father comes home, and I'm the youngest, so I'm Stevie. So I, I hear this, Stephen, step back here. So we, you know, behind the kitchen, there's this huge family room. And I go back, and he goes, I got to say a couple things to you. This is after I got hit by the the athletic director just slapped across the head, just a good cuff. And um, he goes, I understand Mr. Buckley slapped you across the head today. Yes. But number one, you deserved it. Number two, we'll never talk about it again. Number three, any questions? And that was it. Um, and I ran it today, you know, you, you know, parents have to be concerned, protective of what goes on. But now... Um, it's just the opposite that, uh, you know, you, you, if, you know, uh, you could lose your job for doing that now. You just, well, why did he say we'll never talk about it again? Well, it's non-issue, you know, it's like, oh, you know, what do we like do? He's right. What are we going to do? We're going to go complain to the principal, the headmaster. So that you he, felt hard done by, is that? No, I was, just, I was just a little boy who got thumped on the head and was telling my mommy. And, uh, but did you kind of complain to your mom? Is that kind of? Well, you know, I think I think little boys, you know, they you felt gonna, sorry for yourself. Man. Yeah, they're going to yeah. pull their mother's apron strings. And, right, right, right. And and your dad was backing up the guy. Is what oh, you're 100%, yeah, 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 yeah. 100%. Yeah, one hundred percent. It's like yeah, uh, yeah. That's just um, yeah. That's just a given. Um, with um, that, you're most likely your kid is wrong. Right. Yeah. 
Um, but I think, I think with, uh, you know, my father was an engineer, but um, he was a true volunteer because he coached the little kids. He was a student of hockey. He loved hockey. And, you know, he would, he loved hockey so much. He got the college newsletter. He read that. He had an antenna on the back of his car and he would go to the highest place in the county. I think it was Madison County. So he could listen to a hockey game on the radio that was being played a couple hundred miles away. He, uh, he had an antenna on our, our roof and you could just turn it. You could kind of, my mother used to say, it's like the whole house was turning because you know, he wanted to get this hockey station from Kingston, Ontario and you know, CBC. So in his little village, we were the only people that got hockey night in Canada because we moved 150 miles south of the Canadian border. We were right next to the Canadian border. Um, but with passion, you know, he was a volunteer coach. Like you said, you know, the coaches in Ireland and rugby and hurling, they're all, they're not paid. They're just doing it for the love of the game. It's not right. a money, money grab. And um, with, I think that's a big problem in junior tennis is that right away people get paid and they get paid too much. But um, with passion, my oldest brother wrote 10 books on ice hockey and the first one he didn't dedicate to anyone. So I gave him the gears and the second one he dedicated to my father and it, it's pretty moving. He said he understood the, 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 the true meaning of youth sports participation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think through my father is that's where I'm empathetic towards the beginner. Right. You know, I'm not looking to coach the kid who's really good. I'm not looking to be in the telephone booth, not the telephone booth, uh, the TV booth. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as a telephone booth anymore, <laughs> even, even for Superman. So your mother had a had a good cure for 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 headaches or, or sore stomach. What was her? She had a good cure for a sore stomach. Well, you know, this they, this they sounds like it, it puts her out of character. But she was an ENFP on the brain typing, the Pied Piper. She had so many people. That everybody everybody thought that my mother was her best friend. My mother used to say, "Don't ever say that someone is your best friend because you're going to hurt somebody's feelings." So I don't. I, I correct people on that. Oh, they're my best friend. No, you don't want to say that. You want to have many, many, many best friends, but um, no, um, certainly if we would say, but I, you know, if I had a friend over and you know, Mrs. Smith, I have a stomach ache, she would just say, oh, I don't believe in stomach aches, go play. And she would do the same thing with a headache. And um, with um, the, uh, you know, just today I was sitting with someone who asked, one friend asked another friend, do you have any Excedrin? You know, so maybe they maybe they had a few too many beers last night is the world I come from, you're never going to ask anybody for an aspirin. If you got a headache, you got a headache, you know, because you had a few beers the night before, just, just shut up, just shut up. <laughs> don't, even, don't even ask. But it's, how, it's really how your parents is, you know. Right. The thing about tough love. Um, and, you know, that, that's, that's gone away. I mean, a kid today, they don't know what brown bagging it is. You know, there was just no way years ago that the kid is going to have a little plastic card and go to Panera or go to Chipotle and spend thirteen dollars on lunch. You know, it's you know make two peanut butter sandwiches and an apple and, and away you go some salary sticks and you're good. So your brothers, um, they also didn't take too much pity on you when you were younger. You, you always talk about the word jackocracy. So can you talk about about how you were sort of reared by them and uh, prepared for the locker room? No, I re remember uh, saying to my brother Matt one time, uh, "What's your, what's your act?" That was the line. He said, "He goes, it's it's the last scene in your play." Um, my brother Matt was, uh, I have, so I'm from a family of eight. So my brother Matt I used to call him Phil for philosophical. He was easygoing. So, um, so I had my father and mother as parents. I had my oldest sister and oldest brother as parents, and I had my younger sister is older than me than my and so the other brother um you know Pike, mike pat and matt so matt matt pretty, pretty much he left me alone but i remember being an outdoor rink matt it's amazing i weighed uh i didn't weigh enough to get a uniform the first year of pop warner football and he weighed too much and you know it's like are we really from the same family so he was a giant at a young age so I take his puck and I flip it up in the snow banks. You know, that means you gotta go and get your puck. And so this is classic. So he, you know, he catches me and 
he's just, he's got me on the ice. He's got my shirt up and he's rubbing my back on the ice and he's rubbing my face. It was snow and um, it was not uh, Jimmy Rydell, it was his brother, Dave Rydell. So Dave Rydell comes over, it's outdoor rink, playing shinny, that means like 20, 30 people playing at the same time. And Dave Rydell says to my brother, Matt, he goes, I thought he was coming to my rescue. I go, all right, I'm not gonna die here. And uh, Rydell says, Mr. Rydell, he goes, is that your little brother? And Matt goes, yes, and, the, and Rydell goes, oh, okay. He skates away. So my brother tortured me a, a little bit longer. Um, I had another brother um, um, said he couldn't wait for me to grow so he could beat me up. But no, I think that um, the way brothers are for the most part is they'll stick up for one another if someone from the outside is taking some shots. But on the inside, um, you know, generally with um, jackocracy is... Um, you have to learn. I don't think tennis kids do this. You have to learn how, how to be around older kids. But tennis kids, for the most part, especially in this country, they're, they're always with a parent. They're always with a coach. And they're never just out on their own. You know, you talk about Boletari years ago, and you think of Anna Cohn and David Wheaton, um, so many players, uh, Agassi, Courier. And they would just go out back and, and just play. Um, it's like with uh, Michael Jordan, with um, the coach from North Dakota. Give me a second. Uh, uh, not Pat Riley. Dun, 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 dun. Read his book, uh, famous guy. So the, co the players are arguing, and uh, he just leaves the key and says, "You guys work it out." You know, that's where to have a captain's practice. Um, kids should regulate kids, and but. Uh, Vic Braden, a uh, psychologist, he had a course called uh, Vic's Vacant Lot. I love that show because the entry of the show with my van was, was on TV every time they turned it. It was an ESPN, short-lived, short but it was an ESPN series. And Vic, uh, we had this on the podcast with Vic. He was ABD, all but dissertation, right. because he wanted to prove that you could really help a kid in um, Sandlot Sports, which doesn't really exist anymore. Where there's, you're just going to pick up teams and you play from kickball to the, the softball to baseball and that that um, backyard sports doesn't really exist anymore. So um, yeah, I think the older brothers. Um, a, a great um, book to read is John Stockton, the basketball player. And actually, the late Will Chamberlain said that if he had to pick a basketball team, all-time basketball team, all-time best players ever, he first picked John Stockton. It's a great story, the underdog, the comeback kid who, um, the uh, Gonzaga that, you know, will he even be able to play there? And, um, you know, when you listen to, you get on YouTube and you can listen to these Hall of Fame speeches, it's amazing, amazing down the line how someone who's really, really successful in sports, uh, they have the older brother to thank. Mm. You know, many times in tennis, um, you know, I think of a kid by the name of Jeremy Wurtzman. Um, I met Mark Wurtzman too late, and then he didn't get the same help fundamentally as, as Jeremy. But Mark, he went first. You know, he he, yeah. he, he burned the path. Um, you have a thing about uh, Jimmy Connors too. Uh, his mother correcting him. I've, I've, you've said it a few times, but what did she say about him being wanting to be his brother or whatever? Yeah, you know, you look, look back at Wimbledon, you know, there was US Open, there was no chairs for players to sit down. Richard Williams broke the rule one time. They called it the Nick Ball Terry rule because Nick used to run on the court and put his arm around whoever whoever won. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and he was recruiting great players. And, you know, I mean, first uh, you think of someone like Jimmy Arias and Aaron Krikstein. Um, But Connor's uh, glory was right there when he won Wimbledon. He said, I always wanted to win Wimbledon. She said, no, you always wanted to beat your older brother, right. your older brother, John. Um, so it's the humidity, I suppose, is what you definitely got from from your brothers. You, you were never the big, the big hotshot. You were the the little squirt, I guess. Very, no, I was de I, I was definitely a little squirt. I think with yeah. uh, in hockey, I always talk about there's a division called squirts. Yeah. Where in tennis, I mean, I just I'm a high performance coach, and right. I, I I I coach the world class group, and uh, that's all marketing. Yeah. Make, make people feel good. Um, so what about uh, your education? You went to Catholic school. Right. Um, 
what sort of an effect did that have on on you and and then your boarding school as well there, there was that sort of austerity rigor at least maybe not austerity but discipline that was kind of drilled into you not just from your parents but in well, school as you well know, I, I could go work backwards I, I remember at prep school and that's part of the reason i'm in tennis um that it was a completely different prep school that my brother went to different headmaster than what happened in the because of the vietnam war and and and, and students uh, demonstrating on campus and college campuses closing and you know student, student riots. Um, they, my brother, Matt, graduated from this prep school in 69. I graduated in 73, completely different place in many ways. So John Cotton, great guy, he was the headmaster and he later became the headmaster of St. Andrews in Boca. So I, you know, I spent time with him in Boca Raton, but um, they dropped the policy where you had to play a sport every season. So they were letting the hockey players, you know, they didn't have to play a spring sport. And we just goofed around. I mean, we just played play street hockey every day in the old gym. And then my senior year, it was, hey, Smith, I used to run cross country to get shaved. They said, Smith, why don't you run the two mile? And I had senioritis, so I said, I'll play tennis. But, um, no, I can remember my senior year, I always tell people I was, I was the top 10 in my class. There was only 70 in the class and I was 10. So I wasn't the top 10%. I don't think they even do class rank anymore. And so we go to a meeting, all the seniors and it's all boys, all coat and dyes. And they tell us that we can take classes the last semester pass fail. And how does this work? And he said, well, you can keep the same average as the semester before. And you just take classes pass fail. They used to have this, uh, what did they call it? There was some mini, mini week or maxi week where they stopped classes and we could take any, we take these courses, short courses. I took fencing one time. My father, you know, candle making. There was just all these different things. My father was just shaking his head. And, you know, so with, um, so I, I remember the phone number was three numbers and it was a party line in this. You had to crank the phone from this school out and it's you know, just a few miles from Dartmouth. And um, my father, um, I, I had a 0, 0.00. And he calls me up because he didn't know I was taking pass fail. They didn't let the parents know. Mm. So, and this is halfway through the semester because they have these, re, what are they, uh, report card, uh, review or something that halfway through, let the parents know how you're doing. So I was a wise guy and I said, well, I got a three O's, 0 0.00. And, you know, if he could have come through the phone and, and like Max Buckley, turn his ring around and clip me across the head. Uh, I only remember him hitting me, slapped me across the head once, but I felt like any time he could, he, he was very quiet, but every, and I mean, I can do his voice, you know, I'd like to say I do my, his voice better than anybody uh, who ever met him. But um, so, I did, I try and explain to him. I said, it's a great deal. I said, I, I'm going to be able to keep my same average and I'm just taking everything pass fail. And I remember him saying, I called the headmaster today and you are no longer taking classes pass fail. So, I mean, I just really remember just scrambling and went to each teacher and, and you know, it was not, you weren't even thinking about doing the extra credits. I know I'm not doing that or why well, bother. Yeah. And, uh, but the, the nuns, um, with, um, no, I think that, uh, a difference between Catholic school, in public school, in the back in the day, elementary school, the Catholics were smart because what they did in each classroom, they put a bathroom. There was no going down the hall. Going to raise your hand, so I have to go to the bathroom. You know how many tennis kids? I mean, you just, if you just, it's cumulative. All your different experiences over the years. Um, my son Connor was a master at this. Is when there was a ball pickup, he had to go to the bathroom. Right. You know. I mean. You know, so that put him actually in the majority. It's like, I figured this out. I don't want to pick up balls. This is when I have to go to the bathroom. Yeah. Um, the, um, but no, I think that's where some of the things where I tell people PPP, parental permission for pounding. I mean, that's when I went to Catholic school, that's what the nuns had. And, um, you know, granted, there's certainly times where it could be abusive, but, you know, Lou Holtz, it used to be where, uh, a student would ask, a child would ask, what are my obligations and responsibilities? And now they want to know what are the rights and privileges. Right. So the tail's wagging the dog, things are upside down, things are backwards, and um, yeah, it's not going well. There's a lot we, of parallels we, with tennis too. I mean, if, if people 
like the customer is the is the kid. If the kid's not happy with how the coach is doing, if the coach gets fired, you know, so yeah, that's, that's then, one parallel. You know, you then, then, then it comes down to the bottom line is that uh, he wants to make a living. You, you know, know, I travel and I've worked as a consultant, and I go and I say, well, and you go and you observe and you see the program, and you know, it's organized crime. Mm. You know, no one's really learning. I mean, it's, it's amazing how that takes place here, there, and everywhere in tennis teaching. And uh, but if so, now they like action. You know, pump up the balls, happy, busy, good, and and no one's really learning, no one's really developing. So when you say ready, play, the kids can't play, mm -hmm. and there's no accountability. Um, so it's to say, okay, well, at least for the kids that are 12 and under, um, the um, yeah. So discipline the, the, from the book, positive coaching, dim it. Desire is much more important than talent. Discipline is much more important than talent. Dedication is much more important than talent. And, you know, don't get D's in school, but understand those D's, you know, desire, discipline, dedication. So you were a college dropout. Uh, you wouldn't put that on your, no, I don't know, no, resume, I mean, but, but it's well, true. It, I, I don't want to, I'm half joking about, no, I that, mean, but, I, but you're a department head. So I just think that's a funny sort of a dichotomy or juxtaposition. Uh, dropout, so you, uh, <laughs> you don't no, like no i mean i'm proud of being a dropout uh, i mean bill gates is a dropout he was born the same year i was right steve jobs too right yeah so um you know you can find out that academia goes in circles but you were a you were a department head which is why it's really funny i mean you're not a college dropout who went and made the iphone you you were a department head in a college so can you tell us how on earth well did that, how did that happen well one and i hate to say this is um i wasn't a draft dodger but the Vietnam War, my, my three older brothers, they would never have thought of doing that. Um, well, let me backtrack. My brother, Pat, um, he, he went to South Carolina, um, played golf, he was a really good golfer, and um, he actually was in the military during the height of the Vietnam War. And he actually got his orders to go to Vietnam. But he was such a good golfer, it's not very, probably not very nice to say this, but during the height of the Vietnam War, he was um, hitting golf balls with the generals. You know, he, he I remember my mother, uh, she had snake phobia. She said, well, I'm going to write a letter and tell, the, tell those people in the military that you're afraid of snakes and you can't go to Vietnam. But actually, uh, the, the rink at Colgate, Steve Riggs, I mean, I get very emotional thinking about Steve Riggs. I never, he was too old for me to really realize how good a hockey player he was. But the rink, uh, they have a new rink at Colgate. It's named after Steve Riggs. He would graduate from Colgate and just took it upon himself. He, he went to Vietnam, stepped on a landmine. Wow. So um, certainly going away to school, when you go away to school, um, I, I went away from home when I turned 16 the summer before I uh, went to prep school. Um, in fact, it was before I turned 16. Um, which you suppose you had to be 16, but you, know, you your parents know somebody. And so I got a job in the Adirondack Mountains working as a dishwasher. And it's just, I remember my father saying, you got to learn what it's like on the other side of the tracks. And I, I grew up on a lake and I remember this mountain camp, there was, a, there was a lake and it was like, it was just great for me. You can't use these canoes. You can't use these sunfish, these sailboats. Um, so and then, to, then they go to prep school um, yeah, so it wasn't, you know, for, for a dropout, um, you know, Mark Twain, don't let, um, don't let the classroom interfere with your education. With, um, you know, I have a couple older brothers that I think my, our, our mom helped them so much with their, their academic side, you know, helping them type paper after paper. And, and uh, you know, I just, you know, cynical, you kind of look back and go, well, you know, is, is this really all, this academic thing, is it really all worth it? Mm. And um, the um, I, when I, I ended up being at Tyler Junior College, and I qualified based. You see these ads where equivalency of. So I had all this clinical background. Plus, it's not what you know; it's who you know. I mean, I talk about the late Eugene Allen in one of our podcasts. Um, but I was taking. I was allowed to go to grad school, and you know, I think of Ed Faulkner, who wrote a great book. Um, I should be able to just tell you Ed Faulkner's book. He was really well known in the 60s and he went to Cornell and he never graduated from Cornell. He just took classes that would help make him a better tennis teacher. And when I was taking 
um, undergrad and grad classes, um, I eventually stopped and just started coaching juniors. I already, already was a department head. And the reason I started really emphasizing coaching juniors and the guinea pigs is everyone was saying that I was too young to train tennis teachers. And so what happened was our guinea pigs, and someone comes to visit me to this day, um, coaches will come in and um, our students, I mean, you experienced that. You came in as an intern and, you know, next thing you know is you got a 10-year-old helping you on how to hit a backhand. Yeah. So, no, I, uh, you know, to drop out, um, I think for my, coming back to the little boys talk to their mother, I remember getting the idea that I said, I want to pursue the tennis. The tiebreaker came on the scene. Tennis was on TV. Tennis boomed. And telling, telling my mother, I said, I got this idea that I, I want to drop out of school and pursue a career in tennis. But at that time, my father was, you know, I'm the youngest of six. And um, my sister had already graduated from, my youngest sister was older than me. She just graduated from Cornell. And my father was saying, you know, five through one to go, five through one to go. So um, the, um, no, I, I went back and, and you know, certainly, um, you know, I go through the education system to have an AAS and a, an AA, AAS. And, but, you know, there, I mean, I never even looked at the idea where, you, you know, uh, this school, um, you know, that's when it were, uh, Craig Tiley ended up spending so many years with us. He was at the junior college, but then the, down the street was the University of Texas at Tyler. And, um, you know, they had a four-year degree in general studies, but it was like, um, I wouldn't recommend that. Um, to, you know, I think really, um, yeah, I, yeah, I think I wouldn't recommend it, but now with the prices going up, it's, and in some ways, if you're going to go to college, you know, maybe you only have to go for a hard major. Maybe you only have to go to college to be an engineer, to be a in the medical, to be yeah. in the medical world. Um, Eighty-five percent of people are not working in the field they studied in. Eighty-five percent—that's an amazing number. I used it earlier. Eighty-five percent, give or take, the kids who don't make their lineup as a freshman don't make it as a sophomore. Eighty-five percent of uh, people who start a business—they don't make it. The business doesn't make it. So, uh, I'm gonna go another question or two. As maybe it's a long podcast. Yeah, no, no worries. Um, well, y you mentioned w there was a guy you would play tennis with. He was uh, the chair of the board of trustees at at Tyler, right? And one thing that he knew about you was uh, you said or y you knew tennis. So, how did you go from uh, dropout? Call it, yeah, <laughs> but and but but like, how did you get to know tennis? You, you mentioned I'm not just going to go to a conference and and listen to someone talk for an hour. I want to go. You use the the phrase. I want to know what toothpaste Braden is using. So so you went over. How did you how did you approach Braden? And then how did how did you develop that relationship that you had? You know. Well, I think yeah. I think you have to read. Uh, for me, um, that's amazing. I think I get Sports Illustrated. I mean. In some weeks, I mean, issues, I don't even open it. It's really sad. I mean, I used to read it cover to cover. And, you know, now you just, you know, and there's some fun things. I mean, I think on a daily basis, just, um, it was yesterday. Dave Anderson sent me a film of one of his students, uh, you know, 83 years old, and he's coming back from shoulder surgery, and he's dropped it in the forehand. Panam Paul, same day, she sends me a film of a young five-year-old hitting the ball, six-year-old hitting the ball really well, same day. Uh, Joey Johnson sends me a film. His son Spencer's on a mission. He's hitting against a, a portable backboard, and you know we've recently made a video for him again, again, again. And there was a film shown to him that he hit the ball better when he was 12. And now, hopefully, on this mission, he's gaining maturity. So, um, with um, go back in senior moment. But just basically, you, you, the process. Um, what was your can you just take Eugene, us through your Eugene Allen? But yeah. but no, your your relationship with Braden, the the timeline of that, and how how did you get from stranger yeah. stranger to you know? Well, he, he calls you, know, you the observer's observer. Well, again, Eugene Allen is someone who's a president of the board of trustees, and it's like, how did that happen? Um, like, here's the football kid, run with it. Um, he had set up a program for dental hygienists. I didn't know how it worked. As a president of the board of trustees, he was the president of the president. Such an easygoing guy, such a class act. But, um, you know, you read. Like Jack Kramer said, I don't want to uh, read about kings. I want to go and visit. I want to go and meet kings. 
And um, with, again, that sense of adventure, if it wasn't for the Vietnam War, and it's like, okay, I, I'm very proud of the fact that I was 19 years old, I got on an airplane. And back in my day, you rode buses everywhere. So I never got on an airplane before the age of 19. And I, I flew to Florida, I had $1,100 in my pocket and didn't know one person. And, um, you know, you just, you, you find out, um, you know, if you're gonna volunteer, I'm here, I mean, I'll do, you want me to rake leaves, you want me to do whatever, I mean, I'm here. And I just wanna be around it. And you gotta support yourself. And you got to find out a way to do that, and it's like, okay, I'll take the the role of starving artist. I mean, if you mean that uh, the passion, you know, so the, there's so many famous actors, and you know, they're they're not consistently, continually paid. They're looking, looking, and looking for work, but you know, well, they go to New York City, for example, and they're bartending, they're driving a cab, they're waiting on tables, and um, because they want to get close to what they want to do. And, right. um, with, you know, I mean, I took it upon myself. I mean, I remember Elliot Telsher, who's a top 10 player in the world. And, um, he, I was put myself in a position where I was watching Robert Lansdorf teach tennis and, uh, Telsher, who at one time was in charge of American tennis. Uh, you know, we were about the same age and he said, what are you doing? I said, I just, I watched lessons. And you know, and he goes, I can't believe you're doing that. Nobody does that. <laughs> and um, well, you know, you you hear about Dennis Vandermeer as Dennis Vandermeer, you know, being in the South Ar African Army, and um, you know, even my father, who was an engineer one time, uh, he was being trained to uh, put a rifle together. You know, being then he's going to be shipped off to, uh, and he was at a young age. He was already a college graduate. He should have been an officer, but he was. In the infantry and with uh being in world war ii so he falls asleep and so they call him up front and to, hey soldier you know demonstrate how you put this gun take it apart put it back together of course being an engineer he could do that um vandermeer used to study elementary school teachers um you know you can learn from everyone and um you know teaching um is such a um, a privilege to have students and um, you know, I think it's really a, a, a tragedy how easy it is to become a tennis teacher right. so, so Bryden was in Florida when you, when you met him first or where was he when you met or was he over in California you know I worked for All American Sports Andy Brandy was two years older than me and I showed up and I had met Andy the summer before and through Andy that's he was taught by Welby, and I ended up going to spend time with Welby. But um, I remember showing up in the Hamptons, and I told Andy, I said, I'll work every day. I'll work from sun up to sundown. But I said, you know, Vic Braden is going to be in New York City for three days with getting aerial, and I need to be there. <laughs> and, he's, and it's like, yeah, okay. Um, so, but I'm like anyone with Vic back in the day, is that he came into the living room. You know, he was doing commercials on PBS, and... Uh, he didn't write a book until 77, but he's certainly all sorts of magazine articles. Um, there was an article in Sports Illustrated. Again, this is all repetitive for people who listen to our yeah. uh, podcast on Braden. May 10th, 1976. It was an article that, you know, you think, okay, this had a major impact on my life is uh, tennis is in the Stone Ages. And um, no, I volunteered. I volunteered to show a film in the Boca Raton Mall. And by watching that over and over again, I knew that Vic was not just a funny guy. Right. So, you know, you got to hang in there and you got to be curious and um, you're never going to get it the first time. And you only know it if you can say it. You only know it if you can show it. And, um, but, you know, I, I, you know, I look back and, uh, you know, the best hockey coaches I ever had, maybe the best term is teachers, were figure skaters. My oldest brothers didn't have that, but I it just came along where they were using, you know, they were starting to teach power skating. I don't think my older brothers... Um, I have one who's 10 years older than I am. I don't think that he, growing up, ever saw, he, ever, he never saw himself skate on, skating on film. Um, with, um, no, I just think growing up in this small town, watching a high school, Sam Vola watching, as a seventh grader, my study hall, lunch period, and PE class, watching the football game on a Monday that I went to on a Saturday. Right. And, you know, all those influences... 
Um, you know, now kids, uh, they're not in the same room watching the same TV with their grandfather and the father. And, and now the kids got a phone in their pocket and, uh, kids, you know, they love tennis, but they don't even watch tennis. Mm. You know, um, you know, in our sport, you know, kids don't really know the history of tennis. You know, we tell people, you know, we don't want people to really spend a lot of time in social media, but we put something on Facebook. We've missed two days in like 12 years. And, you know, we expect our students to take a few minutes every day and look at Facebook. And it's, um, and if the parents want to say, well, we'll screen it, you know, not screen it, but yeah. if it's a little bit long, it's a school day, you got you to read it on the weekend. Right. But I tell people, um, you've mentioned like Shay and Mallory, great kids, some of these kids, Allie by the first name, great, great kids. Mm -hmm. And they're busy, but they have to make choices. So when you're told you're not in our program unless you... Watch the videos. You know, like I wrote something on Sant Santana, he passed away, and I, I very seldom do this, but I went back and I put a comment uh, like Seve Bellasteros, the golfer, the great movie Seve, poor kid from Spain. He had a caddy to be, a go be a, to play golf, and Santana had to be a ball boy. Um, with those lessons, uh, I think that parents should be telling their kids what their what their grandparents had to do. Right. So it sounds like you you working for free seems to have been a massive. I mean that that was a. Really good idea. Yeah, obviously, that sounds like I still it. do. I still work for free every day. Right. I mean, I we put you, we we spend endless hours on content. But I mean, it gave you so many opportunities back then that that other people wouldn't have. But I wasn't opportunistic. Right. I right. wasn't opportunistic. No, you, I mean they were deserved. It's just interesting. You know, people don't think that way. Well, you, know. you mentioned something about Harry Hoffman today as well. You said, um, do you mind touching on that? He a way he would test someone coming for a job interview. If, if they would yeah, accept we, the money. Yeah, I've talked to Chuck Creasy, um, the captain um, of Chuck's team, uh, is a student of ours, and he told me the story. So it's like, we want to hear from the horse's mouth, so we'll, we'll, get, we'll get Chuck on a podcast. And uh, Chuck and I have some things in common where we work for All-American Sports. Uh, um, he's a little older than me, although he has a full head of hair, and I look older than him. But... Um, yeah, it's just clever. Harry Hopman, um, you know, getting a little bit of trouble. Mary Lay, excuse me, not Mary Lay, Mary Carrillo, I believe, is the only woman who ever coached for Hopman. And he used to say women are too emotional. Um, couldn't get away with that today, perhaps. But uh, his uh, second wife, Lucy, first wife, passed away at early age, great tennis player. But um, he would have somebody be interviewed, give his wife a lesson, and the wife would try to pay him. And then if the person accepted the money, wasn't going to hire them. Right. You know, with uh, you got to exceed expectations. You got to go beyond the call of duty, and you know it's really, really sad. I mean, I just think that uh, you know, I tell people that they really should teach three years for free. Right. No, you've said that to me a number of times. People should be paying to apprentice for some for for someone who knows. Yeah. No. How it's, to do it. Yeah, it's backwards. You know, I mean. Yeah. You know, because you can hit the ball and kids kids grow up with some confidence because they can do just that, hit the ball. Yeah. Um, I don't think a kid initially should work in tennis. I don't think it's a job. Right. I think a kid should go get their hands dirty. I think they should rake leaves or scrape shutters or, right. you know, I don't, it's not a job when a kid is working, you know, they're, they're showing up at the tennis club they grew up at and they're, they're helping the peewees. I don't think that's really a, a job. I mean, I think it's like, okay, I'm going to break my back here a little bit. Right. So I've got three three questions for you, and then that might be be enough. Um, yeah, we could break a record on our on length right. of podcasts here. I if anyone's still there, I, I know Holt Holt is probably listening, huh? Maybe I don't know if anyone else. But um, well, let's go through the her, on a first name basis. Uh, there is only one Holt. Holt Vaughn <laughs> works for Apple. Great guy. I tease people and say I gave him personality lessons. Uh, both his wife Tracy, they're they're capital P's on the brain typing, but uh, they are really doing a great job with uh you know the tv show from years ago my three sons yeah but go holt what's the question on holt no nothing to do with holt i'm just saying he's listening probably oh, but he's uh, listening okay but uh you've been teaching tennis 48 years you've taught i've heard you say 10 number ones in the ncaa's your son got to 200 in the world uh i want to hear from your mouth what's your proudest proudest accomplishment that you think you've you've made in all that time um you know that you're not supposed to be proud. You know that story too, right? It, 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 my father used to say, uh, "No, go ahead." My father used to say, "Don't you have any pride?" Um, but you know, I've had a lot of kids, unfortunately, uh, become alcoholics, 
and I've been to a lot of AA meetings. And, you know, you're taught the 12 steps and you're taught never to be proud. You know, it's like you don't say, hey, I have gone six months without, a, without, a, um, without having a drink. Um, have pride, but don't be proud. You know, I call kids all sorts of things, but I, I don't make it stick. But, you know, we have so many kids that are peacocks. You know, they just want to show their, their, their wonderful colors. Um, but um, go ahead, repeat the question. Senior What's your here. proudest accomplishment? Yeah, proudest accomplishment. Before you I, I hope I haven't reached it yet. But, um, no, I think having taught so many people to teach tennis. Right. And um, I cringe when I hear it because people can recognize. I mean, it, Are you, know, you great, guys? <laughs> well, that, but, uh, you know, so... A little girl from New Jersey sees a, an older boy from Massachusetts a couple of days ago at a national tournament, and they just know right away. They just look, and they just know that they've been trained. It's like Arthur says about Welby Van Horn. You could tell his student from a mile away. You know, that doesn't, in one sense, it doesn't make me proud because tennis teaching is taught so poorly. You know, there's, there's kids that have great, there's coaches out there that are teach, teaching character and teaching kids to be very, very competitive, and it's like Jose Garrett says about 12 and under, somebody's got to win. Uh, but um, no, I think, um, you know, so many things I could say, uh, I was in a conversation the other day with a highly educated friend who's um, meeting Brandon Flanagan for the first time. And, and he's talked about my oldest son was the best in Florida at 10. And my youngest son was the best in Florida at 18. Well, were they really the best? You can't go by a ranking, but they're ranked one. And it's like, well, okay, what we're doing may work. Mm. You know, uh, with uh, Riley DeHart, what a great competitive spirit. Uh, we talked about him a little bit last week with Ed Crass, and um, I understand he's playing pickleball now. But, you know, so now there's a kid who became number one. And um, with uh, so many with kids that, um, you know, like Liam Draxel, I think it's, it's been more time influencing his dad than lean, but he, you know, there's a kid who'd be number one, but we're not telling people that we, we that, that, that he, that he's one of the kids we worked with, even though we did work with him. So, um, with, uh, you know, you know, that's certainly great, but oh yeah, this kid became number one. Um, but I think that it comes back to Braden is, uh, you know, you know, some kids are good despite the coach and, you know, did you really help a kid with their confidence? Did you help a kid go on and, you know, have a better work ethic in school. And because of that, they learn to shake hands, look someone in the eye and send a thank you note. And, and, um, no, I think, you know, certainly I can't take credit for that, but I mean, there's so many people that, you know, if they become a pillar in society, you know, good citizen, but, you know, did they learn character? I get a lot of apology letters from people that, you know, sometimes it's from 10, 20, now 30 years ago. And, you know, now they have children and they look back and, they know that they didn't get in line and, and, and do what they were told. But wow. um, and what would they be apologizing for? Just not listening to you, basically? Um, being a negative influence to other students. You know, being a cancer, it's a very tough word. Um, that's how coaches talk, though. Hey, you know, it's terrible. You shouldn't really talk that way. But, but a bad apple, that's a... Bad apple is better yeah. than, you know, to really say that kid's a cancer. He's eating away at the program. And... This is that Tyler... No, it's it's everywhere. Or just it's different everywhere. programs but, you're but, running. No, but it's everywhere. I mean, Tyler, I mean, let, let's look at it. You know, if you looked in decades, you know, so I'm 67 years old and, and um, so I'm heading towards 70. So it's seven decades. If you were to think in decades, you know, you can think in days too, but you know, I spent 10 years in Potsdam, New York. I spent 10 years in Tyler, Texas. I spent 15 years in Tampa, Florida. Um, I've, I've done some short stints. I did this for two years, like... Like recently, I hear people talk about tennis and Memphis is nonprofit, but um, no, I think that you know where you put yourself second, you know, and you put your students first, and it's like okay, I just keep going and going and going, and um, it's um, you know what we do, and I wouldn't necessarily say this is a recommendation, but if you're in the player development business, you don't really take a day off. I mean, certainly. Um, I think I met someone, I mentioned this uh, father from Minnesota. He's talking about his own father where every Sunday he went to church. So he took, he didn't, he goes on, he goes, but by Sunday evening, his father's sitting down and going to work. 
And then so the, his father's done it his whole life. So consistently having a work ethic, and, and in the end, what are you working for? Mm. Um, you know, you have to have a cause that's bigger than yourself. And, you know, it's, uh, I guess you could say we're, that I'm a dreamer and have some people like Andy Fitzell and others that have helped me out so much is that care about the game. Who are the guardians of the game? Tennis is in trouble. Tennis is in trouble. And the, the leadership of tennis, unfortunately, they don't really know tennis. They mean well, but they just don't know tennis. Um, so, um, no, I think just be proud to get up every day. And, you know, I think it's kind of like a drop in the ocean. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, we don't get up with the idea of, okay, marketing and, you know, how can we make money? And it's like, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a, a group. And I have you know, people, uh, hopefully like yourself, we in, inspire uh, to uh, aspire and that, uh, you know, really be caretakers for the sport. I think that'd be something to be proud of. Making tennis, teaching better, yeah. So uh, one of the things that you teach teachers how to do is teach kids how to play tennis, right? Now, a lot of kids come to the tennis house with you because uh, not only do they want to learn how to hit the ball better, but they, the parents want them to learn character. So can you give us some, some top tips? <laughs> On well, building character. Well, it's a snapshot. You know, I haven't always run a tennis house per right. se, but where you can have a kid come in as your guest. You know, that's actually a spinoff. I hate to even say it. 9-11. One of my brothers was a vice president for Oneida Silver, and he lost his job because of 9-11. You know, people lost their lives. And then what happened with Oneida Silver is uh, air, airlines didn't use any more. Uh, they, they went to plastic utensils. So that company, you know, what happened to that company is you just think, gee, this is what happened with 9-11. It's, it's amazing when things uh, happen and then it's... The knock-on effect, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So um, at that time, you know, uh, you know, you have children and it's like, okay, how are you going to pay for the orthodontist? How are you going to pay for this? How are you going to pay for that? And so I used to have groups come from all over the world and they would stay in hotels. But for uh, with 9-11 for six months... It was like no one's ever going to travel again. So what I did is I said, okay, I'm going to put together a, where people can come on an individual basis. Um, but, um, you know, again, if someone stays with us, um, we had a kid from Argentina the other day observing a kid from Canada, and the kid from Argentina is laughing. He goes, the kid from Canada has never watched a dish in his life because it's his first time. And then... You know, and you talk to the kid, great kid, and he's doing his best, but he's never had to wash dishes. And, you know, so that's where parenting, um, you know, that's where I, I've traveled and, and, and done just that. It's had workshops just for parents. And, you know, actually, you save water when you use a dishwasher. But if you have different tennis players coming and going, we've had rules where, no, you don't use a dishwasher. Um, but, no, kids don't know how to wash dishes. Um, they don't do chores. Parents don't really know how much they do for their kids. It's like when one spouse passes away, that's when they, the one spouse, as say the widow or the widower, that's where they find it like, whoa. They, 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 don't, they, they don't even know what, the, what their partner in life is doing, all mm -hmm. the extras. So, um, but the tennis house character, you can't teach technique. You can't teach anything to a high level unless you teach character. You know, you have to teach character first. Uh, but it, I don't think really that in, in the tennis cultures, tennis so-called tennis cultures, that that is much. That not much is going on. I mean, it's. Uh, I don't want to be in, insulting, but most people in tennis are providing a service, and they're working hard. They're in the hot sun. They're dragging the balls out. They're pumping out balls. Um, but I mean, are they filming? Are they reading? Are they studying? And do they really know? Um, the nuts and bolts of tennis. Um, you know, we always say that, you know, they, oh, they don't know the nuts and bolts and they don't know the X's and O's. Roberto Calla worked with me. Uh, I made a mistake on this podcast, said he's from Bolivia, but, but he is from Peru. And, you know, he watches someone play and he'll just say no information. But the kid may win the match because he's just a great fighter. Another thing too is that early on, if a kid's not taught information, their game is, their game is very primal. 
you know, they're not trying to play a one-handed, underspin backhand, cross-court, keep the trajectory low, karaoke step coming in. You know, they're just banging. They're just banging. And uh, you said it earlier that you were really wound up by just wanting to win. Mm -hmm. Yeah, winning is a joke. So, someone, you, know, you got that from one of the Indian parents, I think, or something, right? No, Octavio Garcia. Oh, sorry. Um, actually, I'm supposed to talk to him tomorrow. Bright, bright guy. And, um, you know, I'm very, very fortunate with parents. Uh, I've learned so much from parents. Um, I've also learned, I'd say, the do's and don'ts. Um, you know, I, I just can tell story after story. And, you know, a lot of times you don't want to use names for sure, but uh, people make a decision and you just know that's life altering. You know, they've made this decision and it's like, you know, why, you know, that's not the best decision. You know, your, your, your kid, your kid says they want to be a competitive tennis player. And, you know, sometimes you make, you make those tough decisions where, you know, you're going to be away from home. You're going to miss a holiday. Um, you know, that type of thing. So this is one, I think, uh, my last question for you, but with three parts. So a book that, I, I think you talked with Andy on one of the podcasts about tennis books, right? Now, if you were to recommend for a tennis teacher, a tennis parent, and a tennis player, maybe the answer to all those questions is uh, tennis for the future, but a book for those three demographics that they should read, do you think? Um, could you answer that? Uh, we were talking about this, this the other night. Um, bounce, talent code, talent's overrated. Um, and I'm forgetting one, um, but it's all about how the brain works and how you have to practice. And, That'd be for teachers. Um, no, I, I think, all, I think, I think, it's, I think it's all one. I don't, okay. I don't think that you separate this is for the player, this is for the teacher, this is for right. the coach is that you you really want to teach everyone to be their own coach. And, you know, the parent might take the role, which is ideal that we can be. Um, and again, I should be able to tell you a woman, uh, wrote this in a USPTA magazine, conscientious neglect. You know, the parents, conscientious neglect. You know what your kid's doing. And, but you, you find a way to um, let, let somebody else, you know, be the teacher and be the coach. And ideally, it would be great if the, the player played, the coach coached. <laughs> Say it the right way. The player played, the parent parented, and the coach coached. Uh, but no, it all becomes one, and I think uh, less and less. Um, I think now is asking, okay, what percentage am I the coach? And you know, the, the percentage, the level is going down. You know, you're never 100 percent the coach. Uh, decisions have to be made where, you know, a kid's got an exam and they're not going to go to practice. What, what all those just simple day-to-day -day things. But um, no, I think that uh, you know, granted, you have to get around to. Uh, you know, Braden's book will stand the test of time. You know, oh, people say it's not relevant today. Uh, th that is just absolutely crazy. You know, 19.1 degrees. I mean, what a... Unless uh, they change the rules, yeah. Oh, they ch unless they change the size of the court, yeah. change the rules. Uh, yeah. They're not going to change the, the laws of physics. <laughs> and um, with... Um, no, so I, I couldn't say, you know, just one book, but I, I would go more on character development, like... Um, like something by John Wooden or something. Yeah, you know, it is um, the power of positive thinking. Yeah, I should just tell you the author of that book is the first self-help book written. I remember going to listen to him speak. Um, there's uh, so many self-help books, but um, the um, yeah, no, I think principle with um, you know really tennis is, should be the easy part. It should be the easy part. Um, you know, I do think that um, a lot should be said for trying to educate the parent. They're blindly writing um, checks. They, they, they're writing checks and they're just crossing their fingers and they just hope. Mm -hmm. And um, the kids just, it's not transformational. They keep doing the same thing. Um, yeah. So you, you have a couple of ideas about, um, you, you say you want to get to 50 years in the trenches. And then do you mind just telling people what what's the plan after that? You, you've talked well, to Well, you know, yeah, okay, yeah, it'd be nice to go two more years. I mean, it'd be nice to, uh, you know, have more more time on planet Earth. But um, with, you know, we have plans to have the Great Base become a nonprofit. 
Uh, it's not making a profit now, but, um, you know, I go way back to Dave Fish telling me that. And Andy Fitzell, uh, he, he coached me on that. I said, we, we just need to have one, two people. We need to do a much better job getting it, getting content out. Um, you know, people should, you know, I mean, you got to listen to your critics. Someone said about um, our course, Tennis Intelligence Applied, it's like drinking from a water fountain. Or excuse me, it's like drinking from a fire hose. Or it's like you go to a giant buffet. But if someone says, okay, I've got a five-year-old, what do I do? Um, no, I saw, so you know, it's like anyone, what do you want to do? We want to do what we're doing, but do it better. And, um, you know, I, there, there is no secret sauce. I mean, we hear people say the game is evolving. Yes, the game is evolving, but not to the point where the alphabet's no longer the alphabet. The numerical system is no longer the numerical system. And it's just crazy. The, the tennis discussions that turn into arguments, they start with a forehand and they end with a forehand. And I mean, it's just, it's, it's tragic. Kids can't go to the net playing doubles. They can't go to the net playing singles. Kids can't play approach volleys. They, you know, you go to a tournament, you don't see a kid hit one overhead. I mean, it's, it's, it's a tragedy. And, but it's, you know, we've heard it over and over again, you know, crummies playing crummier. You know, who wins? Crummy wins, they don't know they're crummy. And, um, you know, it's, that with the Braden study, true, a true Bradenite, and they, they like to say, I say unfortunately, you know, I, I shouldn't say I like, I mean, it's true, but I, I wish I didn't say this, but there's not many Bradenites on planet Earth. There's not that many people walking around that really knew what Vic Braden stood for from an, an academic standpoint. They think they know. And, you know, it's like myself, all the years I spent with Vic, um, I spent... Uh, and that's where it's great to spend time with Andy. Uh, Andy spent so much time with Vic, well, throughout his life, but mainly the last 10 years. No one spent more time with Vic than Andy, except for Vic's wife. And, um, you know, I think people think that we um, put Vic up on a pedestal. But no, he had answers. You know, he eliminated guesswork and um, the miss, uh, the trophy look. Um, you could just tell in an instant, you know, like what someone's being taught on the forehand. And, you know, people watch what we do and they go, oh, that looks so slow and so mechanical and um, don't judge the unfinished product. And, um, you know, like right now what's going on is the Orange Bowl. I know you're headed there with a really good 12-year-old tomorrow and and um, with, she's number one in the country, right? One of the, one or one, two one, or One of the best. And, yeah. But she's got true grit and, you know, um, they tried to get her filmed, but it rained and, you know, some of the coaches I work with and. But, you know, I saw McEnroe play the Orange Bowl. And, you know, what did I know back then? You know, I'm just a little older than he is. I just didn't know anything. And, uh, but you can walk around the Orange Bowl and just watch people's service motion. And, you know, there's always that Pepe Merlo. There's that, always that Francois Durer. There's players, um, Santoro from France. There's always that player that just like, how are they doing this? How are they at this level? Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's where people hang in there for style. You know, there's negatives to great base. There's negatives to solid fundamentals in the sense that um, it's almost like we don't allow for creativity. Right. We're, we're not going to... Are the street smarts? We're, we're, well, no, not that. We're not going to develop, you know, you think of uh, Monica Selish, who arguably, and I don't think, she, I don't even like those conversations, obviously one of the best players of all time, which she did in such a short period of time before she was knifed. I mean, stabbed, um, terrible, 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 but um, her unorthodox style. And, you know, like go way back to Pancho Seguro's two-handed forehand. Um, the, um, so, you know, I think that you, like, that would be a negative of the great base is that, no, it doesn't allow for unorthodox play. Um, but at the same time, if it was really done correctly, like by a governing body of tennis, coming back to the Jesuits, give us the first seven years, coming back to that elementary school, starting a kid when they're five, and then when they're 12, say, okay. Go they're going to develop their own style. Their, their personality will come out. But what type of base did they have? And the way the brain works, I had a conversation with someone today who doesn't play tennis very much. They did a, an internship for with us for a year. You, I mean, you were in on that conversation. And he had, doesn't play much anymore, but he went out today and his serve is now palm up. 
But then when you start thinking about Milan, how many serves in his lifetime, doesn't play anymore, did he hit when he was a little kid that was palm, you know, he hit a palm up. Yeah. It's kind of like the word habit. You don't lose a habit, you, a bad habit. You override it with a good habit. Mm -hmm. And that's where, you know, it's like someone has a flaw in their game. It's like my time with going to AA meetings is like, no, if you're a palm upper, it's like being an alcoholic. Your there's traces of the old, and if you don't always work on it, and that's where you know you could turn to, like I say, Tom Brady. You know, the longevity certainly he's taking care of his body, but he's still working on the same mechanics he was taught in elementary school. And there's there's nothing fancy. You know, there's a clip on YouTube where he's told to decelerate, stop the left shoulder so the right shoulder can go faster, and you know, tweaking it like that. Sounds familiar. But yeah. Um, yeah so is that the third part is it one more i think uh that was what i wanted to ask you yeah yeah the three the three questions were um proudest accomplishment building character and the, the reading list so that's uh with um uh, that's all i had for you yeah no the reading list um the to read and reread too um right yeah you know, we always talk about uh, well you can read a book you know but can you live the book and um, it's not so easy to do. Not so easy to do. I mean, um, to Welby Van Horn didn't uh, write a book. He started one, and then Jim Layton finished it. Finished it. So Welby was published for Paris. He never wrote a book. But Ed Weiss, who we'll get on the podcast, he, he wrote a book uh, about Welby. And um, with, um, but then to actually live it to... If you say, for example, braid methodology, you know, and Vic wouldn't want to ever hear the term, the Vic braid method is really a method of physical laws, you know, Newton and Galileo. But with, if you really study braid, and there's old films and you know, there's books to read, and you could learn more about braid and not being with braid. Right. But the problem is, is that the internet, for example, everybody's an expert. Everybody's an expert. They're all, they're, everybody's trying to put their own twist on it. And, um, you know, Vic Diamond is a coach that I've worked with for a long time, loves tennis, has been a high school coach forever. Um, you know, he was at a, a coach's workshop recently, and, you know, I think it's a great idea. Brad Gilbert said um, he thinks that you should use the transition balls, whether that's orange or green, dot, when a young kid's volleying against the backboard. Hey, that's a great idea. I mean, it's a better idea for me. I've always said, okay, go use a dead ball. But that's just a, a little little nugget you can put in the tennis treasure chest. Um, but in tennis, um, with um, because you know the tricks of the trade, it doesn't mean you know the trade. And a lot of people know some tricks, like, okay, I've got this drill. I've got this other drill. And I got this other drill. And the thing is, is that okay, those are great drills and they have a concept and they have a purpose, but the kids still got an inefficient grip. They're doing, they're, they're doing this and this and it all sounds so good, but it's a grip of a lifetime. And you know, say they're going in and they uh, have a soft grip. In other words, they don't have that base knuckle on, say they're bat one-hander and they're hitting a one-handed backhand volley, they're right-handed and the base knuckle's not on the right side of one. It's on two. And, you know, granted they could jut their wrist out, but... The angle of the racket face determines the angle of the racket path. That's just the way it is. And it's not wrong, but that kid's going to have calculation. So then there's the question, well, all right, you're meeting them at 17. Okay, tell them to get closer to the net. You know, when it comes down to Nadal, he gets so close to the net. He's got almost a forehand grip on the backhand side. He's doing okay. But speculation would be, and if you ask Nadal, I mean, he knows. He, he knows that, um, he, he knows that if he had a conversation with him, he just knows that his backhand volley, I mean, it, it could have been more efficient, you know, so when we make negative comments, like say last week, we were talking about Stevie Johnson, you know, backhand return playing doubles, it's, it's, it, it shouldn't be taken that we're making a negative comment. I mean, Stevie Johnson, I mean, uh, we were watching Victor Lilov, who we coached, play Liam Draxel, who we coached. They were playing a match the other day. We zoomed in, zoomed out, and 
you know, we got there, we didn't see the warm up, we didn't miss a point. And the coaches creatively, they filmed the, the match from way up in the stadium. It's kind of really neat to look at. And um, so we show up and we've got a group of kids. We've talked about even doing a podcast on, okay, what do we do? And we show up to watch a match. The other day, a group of us went to watch uh, a match at the Little Mo. And we've got, you know, kids charting and kids taking notes. And, you know, sometimes we're filming it. And with that, um, I sit down with the coaches or the students and the coaches too and go, hey, these guys are great players. You know, yeah, certainly in one way or the other, we were connected with them. Uh, you know, say one for, um, you know, full time, five year relationship and the other one just a supplemental you know maybe for the same amount of time in fact with lean we did a little video work for him in may um and but i mean you just see the the legs and the, these guys are these guys are great players you know then the question is are they going to make money you know they're very very good lean was recently number one in the ncas and Lilo was top 10 in, in the world and juniors and and uh, you wish them the best, and but we look at it and go, well, what if? What if? You know, what if they had stayed with this little movement? You know, you know, and I mean, I, get, I don't want to get into their games because they're at the level where their opponents possibly could hear this tape or someone say, hey, hey, you're playing it so and so and so and so, and and uh, you know, I think that's unethical. But um, with it is deep, it's not shallow. You know, you got to be a deep thinker. Um, you know, I think tennis coaches should study Bill Walsh. You know, he's probably got the greatest coaching tree of all time. And, um, you know, like Doug Verdick said a couple of weeks ago that when his father lost, he blamed himself. And I mean, we had that, we had that interview with Doug Verdick and he read that letter from his father. Then we put it on Facebook. Um, you know, I've had quite a few people reach out to me and say that letter was absolutely awesome. But that's the type of letter that needs to be copied from Facebook. You know, we need to interview Doug again. And, you know, maybe his brother Randy. And it's just like, people need to know how, how did he do it? Mm. You know, how do you take a kid who's unranked in high school tennis? Uh, you know, they're not unranked and they come in as a freshman and they can't be in the lineup. Like so when you wish, when you show up on a college campus and hats off to lander but you were a redo mm -hmm. and you should, okay kid this is our system this is our system and this is what we're going to do and and uh, you know so we're, hey we want right away we want to make you a five-year player we're going to redshirt you and this is what we're going to do and it's not going to be it's not going to be about winning it's going to be about development you know granted you want to recruit like you know you're a lefty you're really fast you played all these other sports and you're the youngest of six and it's like okay we could recruit this guy but you're um like anyone else is okay you create your own interference there's a great book champions don't get in their own way is um you know i think you're it's great you're a devout catholic and you're off to go feed the homeless for four days in new york city <laughs> but you know to get personal and that's what you do in djokovic you know the pr professional life and personal life become one so right. you're gonna go hang out with your buddy and so you're out on the court today with a little kid from California. Mm -hmm. And I said, you're just like him. You're social. You're wound to be a social animal. Right. And, um, you know, that's where I think someone who's in job placement is going to say, you know, you know, maybe you should be in the hotel business or maybe you should be in event management. And, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. But you, you say you want to be in tennis, then you got to be in tennis. Right. Take your poison. Have yeah. you ever heard of this thing called verbal diarrhea? I think we should stop here. But I think maybe it's good to talk to an Irishman that we might have broke the record with our podcast. So how long was that? Three hours? The, um, but you know, people are driving around in the car and they listen 10 minutes here and 10 minutes there. We realize that it's too much for the juniors. It's too much for the kids that are in school. Uh, but it's not too much. I mean, we have a course 25 hours long. 25 hours. Um, one of our uh, associates, uh, He's trying to help out the son of a former college teammate. And he said, this weekend, I'm going to have him watch Tennis Intelligence Supplied. Um, you can watch it in 25 hours. 
And when we first put it up, we had a webmaster, and he he had all, you could push all the buttons and tell us. Uh, and at one time, it was for sale. And um, the most of the people that bought it, the country, the Americans led it led for purchasing it, but the Serbians led for completing it. Wow. And one of the reasons we came up with a great base, it's an hour and a half, is we found out that people didn't want to do the 25 hour course. There's no college credit. It's not mandatory, there's no test. And, but yet people were charging $100 an hour. And it's, you know, they shouldn't think of it, well, it's this guy, Steve Smith, he's got a huge ego, he's got his own course. It's no, it's like, this is from, you know, really, I mean, people that are in the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we think Jim Jim Verdick should be in the Hall of Fame. We think Jim Lair will get in the Hall of Fame. But um, Vandermeer, fortunately, was just just inducted, and Hopman and Braden. Um, with I talked to Bill Jacobson the other day on the phone. Um, I mean, I think it's just so wrong, wrong, wrong that people are coming across like they're the first people to do tennis analytics, and it's like really, come on, guys. Mm-hmm. You know, there's just way too much self promotion, mm-hmm. and. Uh, but I hope with this podcast, we broke the record. I think Welby Van Horn was almost three hours. But uh, Andy tells always saying, did we give out value? Steve, when are, you, when are you writing a book? When am I gonna write a book? I'm gonna write it on a piece of confetti. Um, you know, I'm asked that quite often, publish or perish. And I think of Mike Costa, he was staying with us and he's got a book, 101 Tennis Tips. Read the book, it's put together quite well. And uh, you know, he was, a, hanging out with us and he had played college tennis and he was trying to play some pro tennis and publish repair. So he's an author. I'm not an author. You know, we do have over, uh, well over 5,000 pages on Facebook. Um, but, um, no, if I were to write a book for the longest time, I thought, gee, I should write a book on how to practice. Um, I've all, I've said this and you know, John Posey, we talked about John Posey. He's a guy who could write it. You know, he's, um, he helped his father write books and, you know, he's, he's been working on a, a novel for some time. Vic Braden is missed and Vic Braden was missed. He was missed. You know, I mean, he touched millions of lives, but really, I mean, we've just gone back and you know, these, these miss the trophy look, um, Scratch your back. Yeah, you hear come, that o- come over, come over the ball. And, um, with, um, no, I think a book should be written, um, consumer beware. Um, you know, the money, it's, it's just a money pit, you know, that, you know, the, tennis is a beautiful sport, but it's just, right now it's just so expensive. And um, so, yeah, maybe, I should, but you know, with the plan to, uh, you know, yeah, GB and I say, okay, I've been, been in the trenches. I, I, I think that people need to be in the trenches. There's a lot of people that are, out on their YouTube gurus and they're imposters. They're telling people that they've taught tennis and they've done this and they've done that. And they really haven't, you know, you've got to um, pound some nails and to build something. And, um, but so, um, yeah, publisher perish. Um, you know, some people have said, have said to me, do you have a book? Have you, and I said, no, I don't even have a business card. Um, you know, a lot of times I'm wearing a, sweatshirt that's from another academy i mean there's just way too much self-promotion um but um you know the the how-to books um there's plenty of them um but no i think it's more like the attitude of the household and the lifestyle and um but i think that's where um we're really missing the boat with uh just how people go about um I've, just, I've met so many kids, late start and bad start, but that's okay. And adversity is a blessing. But, but to be told that, you know, you're, you're say 13 years old and you've been playing tennis for five years and you've had a palm up serve, you've got a Western grip. I mean, the butt of the racket's almost hitting your earlobe and you've been playing tennis for five years and the way the brain works, um, you know, it's very difficult to be the messenger and go, but then the kid says, oh, they want to play college tennis and they love tennis. Um, awareness, acceptance, commitment. They, they can overcome those flaws. But 
you know, again, uh, so much repetition, tennis is, um, is the credibility business. Credibility just means you're believable. doesn't mean you're truthful. And, you know, there's really not that many people. We're a huge country with 300 million plus. There's really not that many people that have taken a beginner. And then all fairness, if they've taken a beginner from, so okay, they played, they were a beginner and they took it all the way to play at a high level, play college tennis. I did a workshop, last thing and I'll shut up. I did a workshop, uh, Michael Center allowed me to do this, University of Texas. My son was playing against the University of Texas. And we must have had 25 people show up. So maybe the match started at, you know, five in the evening and we had bananas and bagels for breakfast and we had sandwiches brought in and we just talked tennis. So I handed out a pad of paper with one column and said, okay, write down the kids that you've worked with for five years, write down the kids you've worked with for 10 years. Now I've had a chance to work with kids a long time because I work as a supplemental coach. They'll come and see me two, three times a year. Um, but it's circumstantial too. It, it, uh, parents move, uh, they change jobs. Um, so um, very few coaches in their, in, on their defense, if they had a true chance to work with somebody for a long period of time. Yeah. And, but anyway, Fergus, leave it there. You're a good Irishman. I don't know about that. Good Irishman, you know, you can chat. We'll, 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 next time we'll do it over the Guinness. Actually, this is what we need to end on. We have to do this. I know we're breaking the barrier, but sing a few bars for us. All right, can I take a sip of this first? Why don't you drink a little water? We could, you can have a sip of that. That's, that's, that's whiskey. Up. Here we go. Yeah, this is everybody, this everybody in Ireland, in the country. I spent a lot of time in the country of Ireland. There's a postcard, it's all black, and it says Ireland by night. The Irish people are great. And uh, my former wife, her family was great. Her father was like an unbelievable guy, He's riding a bicycle with no brakes, and he's 90 years old. But I used to think that everyone can sing in Ireland. I can right. remember the very first time being in Dublin and having one Guinness and go, oh my God, I'm never gonna have another Guinness. I used to drink wimp, wimp beer when I was over there, but I ended up someplace where the guy's playing the spoons. And, <laughs> but are you good to go here? Yeah, I guess so. All right, here Irishman. One evening fair As I took the air Down by Blackwater side T'was in gazing all around me that an Irish lad I spied All in the fore part of the night We rolled in sport and play when this young man arose and he gathered his clothes saying fare thee well today that's not the promise you gave to me when you lay upon my breast But you could make me believe With the fall of your eyes That the sun it rose in the west there's not a flower in this whole world as easily led as I. But when fishes can fly and the seas all run dry, 
It is then that you'll marry I. That's it. <laughs> That's awesome, awesome, awesome. Go. Let me say this is uh, we need to have you play the piano. I actually own a piano. I, you know, I don't know, I paid used maybe eight hundred, five, eight hundred dollars. I can't remember. But uh, when kids come, I ask, do you play the piano? And they say yes, and I make them practice. With uh, I'm going to tell people, as you know, that uh, I taught you how to sing. Right. I didn't learn any tennis that kid, but I taught him how to sing. Well, and with that, I would like to say that your parents have done a great job so far. You haven't done a great job. No. You need to play the piano more. You need to sing more. Actually, just putting everything together with Ed Crass last week. He, I was just telling. I was telling you that he's got these great lyrics. He loves jazz, and um, I told you that you need to write some tennis songs. We've talked about having a a great bass song. Right. We we had some lyrics for Tennis Tech years ago. My game was a wreck before I went to Tennis Tech, um, but um, no, that was fantastic. Uh, we'll have to tell people to uh, skip ahead to the, <laughs> the, the third hour and fourteenth minute and listen to Fergus sing. Maybe I'll put that in the. Uh, you know, the paragraph they read as far as right. podcast number 71. But listeners, thanks. Fergus, thanks. Adios, amigos. What do you, what, can you say something in Gaelic? Slán Tamil. Say that again? Slán Tamil or Slán Gafol. That means bye for now, basically. Bye for now. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Great job, Fergus. Cheers.